fun fellowship Friday night for the Church of the Eternally Secure, CES. I'm emphasizing that word fun. I, that's our main objective on Friday nights. So uh, let's see how much fun we can have together tonight. Uh, before, well, let me see. Uh, I noticed that uh, we had quite a few people raring to go. Oh, they've been waiting quite a while. We're starting pr almost on schedule. So thank you for being eager, everybody in the chat room. Um, let's say hello to uh, the, the chat room before we get started. Sister Angel, why don't you gr greet the congregation? Hello, everybody. Uh, um, uh, we're all back to uh, back together now. I, 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 you know, I feel like it's been forever. Um, and uh, I, I, I did send in a, a last minute true false question. I you know, might, uh, might be fun, but um, yeah, I just uh, want to get, get going and uh, hear from everybody. I, I think Lisa's going to be here tonight. But, uh, oh, and I just wondered too uh, if anybody see, saw the really weird moon the other night. It was like, uh, it was on uh, Wednesday night. It was like a weird, uh, like giant blood red crescent that was barely above the tree line at three in the morning. It was so strange. I, I, I hope at some point during the show, maybe we could talk about um, some of that stuff. Maybe uh, uh, see if anybody else has noticed like the moon acting weird lately. But I had never seen anything like that. I don't know if any of you guys saw that. Did you get? Did I mean I was up late, but you're on. Um, I, I don't really. I mean, I guess on the West Coast, I guess it would still look look about the same. I, I don't know how that works, but this this was like something I wouldn't have ever forgotten. Like if I'd seen it as a kid, it looked like it was supposed to be an event. And I don't think that NASA or any of these people ever even announced that there was going to be like a, a moon that red. So, um, yeah, this thought that was worth noting. I don't know if the chat can fill me in on if they saw it, but <coughs> it's open. Somehow, I'll check somehow it. I missed it and completely. I didn't even look out that side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I, 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 I went out because I realized that um, we left the little car lights on in the car. And I would, I mean, it was so big I, and I, I don't even understand, like, I didn't think the moon was low at that time of night, but maybe, but it, I mean, the size of this thing, it looked like something from a movie. So it was, it was weird, but um, mm -hmm. anyway, I love you guys and I'm glad everybody's uh, back, uh, hopefully back to normal <laughs> from, from here on out. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Sister Heather, say hi to the congregation, please. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really glad that I can make it tonight. Um, and Angel, no, I did not see the moon. I don't really go outside at night very often. It's really cold out here right now. So, yeah, yeah, it was freezing that night. And I, I don't like to be out in the dark. You, I, actually, ever since I was a kid, I didn't. But, um, but yeah, I think probably I'm the only one. Everybody else in this thing, So, mm -hmm. all right. Uh, and Brother Steve, hello. Hello. How you doing? Hey, Steve. Hello you to the congregation. <laughs> the <answers> are hard. <laughs> Steve, what are you on? Some kind of laughing gas or something? <laughs> no, I was. I was hoping you, you were going to ask me to say. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say to me what you said to Heather, and I could just be like, yes, hello to the congregation. Oh, well, yeah. I know, I know that you're, you're very predictable there. So I, I, yes. I threw you a curveball. <laughs> yeah, you did. You, you, you did. Uh, you, you've gotten pretty good at, uh, better, at, uh, at, at making sure you leave it open-ended there. Because <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna be like, if you say say blah blah blah, I'm just gonna say blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're not going to try that trick. It was a you. test. It yeah. was a test, to, you know, to see how well you're doing. Hmm. Okay, let's <laughs> move on. Keep, uh, see how brother. So you must be brother. doing pretty well. I'll tell you everybody about that in a second. But brother Ben, how how would you like to greet the congregation? I would also just like to simply say hello. No, it's it's good to be here. Very good to be here. Um, I saw that moon as well. Uh, it was kind of strange because it was really low and very bright and very what do they call it narrow. I don't know. It was a very just like a, yeah. a sliver. And it was it was kind of neat. It was, uh, it looked like something I only saw in a, like in a textbook or something. Nothing I ever really yes saw in real person. So it was kind of curious. Um, I, I don't think I ever seen a red crescent. 
like crap. Yeah, it wasn't red it. when I saw it. It was just what bright yellow. It did. It was things. only red for yes, yes. It was only that that bright scarlet color for like twenty minutes. I watched it, and then, um, and then as it got up a little higher, then it went to like a, a yellowish red, and then just yellow. But uh, when I saw it, it was. I mean, I I did a double thing. I was like, that's not the moon. I didn't even feel like it was in the right place. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know very much about, about how that works, but I just thought it was weird. It just that's not where I would look for the moon uh, at that time of night either. So, but you know, they say that they know exactly what the moon's going to be doing for you know every night from here to like you know 100 years from now, and I, I don't believe them because I've caught them a lot of times not predicting any type of weird moon activity. And then the next day, the article will be out and they'll just be like, yeah, we just forgot to say anything. Yeah, we knew it was going to do that. We knew, you know, I don't think they know. I think that God, only God knows what the moon's going to do <laughs> many given times. So. Look, you're muted. Oh, okay. Thank you, Ben. Uh, people are probably uh, wondering where Sister Lisa. I got a message from her earlier saying that she was running late. Uh, but there's a good chance she won't be able to make it at all. So we'll see how that, that goes. Okay. Um, all right. I will, well, first, I'll just take one minute to give you an update since some of you are probably curious. Uh, um, the um, horrible sickness I went through uh, was, lasted about two weeks. And so it's been eight days since I started seeing improvement. And I'm just thankful that the, the, the absolute really sick feeling, I, I don't know how to put it into words how, how sick I felt, but uh, that's gone. So I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful for everybody's prayers. <clears throat> but I, I still have not recovered my strength. You know, I still have a, a coughing and throat uh, issue. Uh, so I'm, I might uh, try to uh, be efficient with my answers and not uh, say more than I have to. <laughs> I'm sure that'll please some people. <laughs> but uh, so there, there's your, your update. Um, I, I'm definitely improving a little bit each day. Um, all right. Uh, I guess uh, that's enough for the greetings. Uh, ben, why don't you give us the first uh, true-false question? Okay. Um the first true false question is uh is true or false people should not make promises to god hmm. and i'm not oh that that actually came from uh, nathan gruber uh so uh it you know anyone it's not anyone on the panel so oh okay so uh all right heather would you mind going first on that That's fine. Um, I would say leaning true. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I just think that it's not wise to to make a promise to God because not that not that you would be condemned necessarily for not keeping it, but Oh my goodness, that's that's an apology I wouldn't want to have to make. Um, so I just kind of my my policy on that it kind of thing would be simply to say, God, please help me try to do this and try and stick to the try to do this because I know that without God's help, I wouldn't be able to do anything anyway. So. All right. Thank you, sister. Uh, all right. Uh, sister Angel, what do you say? Still there? Am I still here? Sorry. Sorry. This app is new and I'm having, I was having a hard time uh, finding, finding the, uh, uh, the non-mute button goes away. Uh, on my phone, if if I click, it's weird. Like I'm still getting used to this uh, this program. But um, so I I wanted to uh, to mention uh, Ecclesiastes five five, which tells us that it is better not to make a promise than uh, than to make one and break it. Uh, kind of phrasing. Um, and um, 
I would agree. I feel that promising is, is very akin to swearing, right? So I, I, you know, and we're told to swear not at all. Um, you know, I, I hadn't actually ever thought about it until just now, whether it's a promise is the same thing as, as to swear an oath. But I, I think, I mean, you know, we talk about pinky promises, right? That's basically swearing an oath. Um, and I, you know, I, I think sometimes it's, it's hard not to, uh, not to make promises to people, but I certainly would never make a promise to God. I have, I've never found myself bargaining with God in that way. Um, because I, I feel that it would be silly, uh, anyway, it's, it's nothing that God wants from me that we need to bargain about what God wants from me is ultimately for me. Right. So how do I bargain? With him? Um, I'm not in a position to bargain with him. Um, and what matters is the heart in any case. So because God is, um, he's with us and he, he sees, he sees right through us. He sees right to our core. Um, I can't even imagine what I would promise to him that uh, I, you know, I, I, can't, I, I, I know people do it. I know if you do this for me, God, I promise I will blah, blah, blah. And I mean, since of course the Bible uh, discourages this sort of thing in general, I can't understand what people um, like how people would think that that would be a good idea to literally do to, to God, our creator actually make a promise to, and knowing that, uh, the worst thing you ever, you know, possibly do is to, is, is to break it. Not that I, you know, not that I'm not going to like send you to hell for that. I mean, as a believer, at least, uh, obviously it's not about the punishment part of it. It's about really more the integrity. And I think that for God, um, I, I'm sure for him, it, it seems that those of us who feel like we can bargain with him and make these promises, promise we're going to do this. If he just does this one thing for us, we're missing the point entirely of the relationship we have with him. And I think that, um, I think it just really, uh, it's so hard to even describe. Um, to me, it, it's like it defeats the purpose of that walk with him and, and that, that close personal relationship where, um, he's, he's with me every day. And so he's, he sees all the thoughts of my heart. Right. So whatever like trick I could perform, like, oh, you did this. So I'm going to, I don't know what, like, uh, uh, I'm going to go on a diet or so whatever. Like, what, knows what people promise to God, or I'm never going to do this again. Um, he's looking at the state of art anyway. So whatever, you know, thing you promise to fulfill in the future, I mean, it's, uh, it not only does it not, um, it's not in the right spirit in terms of how, you know, the, the relationship, the honesty, the, the, you know, the introspection, I think God, God wants from us, but, um, and the trust and understanding that, you know, he's our father, you know, not, not somebody that, uh, I, you know, the thing is, is, is that there's no bargaining chip a human being holds where, where that, you know, normally when you make a promise uh, to a person, it's sort of like an exchange. It's sort of like a barter system, right? So it, I can't even, think of something that would be um, appropriate to promise to God, because it's not really ultimately for his benefit that we do anything anyway, it's for our own benefit. Um, and then what are you going to promise? I promise I'm going to what you know go door to door and give the gospel. If you do this one thing for me now, I, that would be a horrible thing to, to promise. But I think that that ultimately the one thing we could say God wants from us is that we share the gospel. Right. But imagine promising that to God in exchange for something else, what's something we should be doing anyway, right? So um, I would um, I would say that, uh, true, we should not make promises to God. Um, and I, I hope that I've explained myself. I had never really thought of it, so it's kind of hard expressing what I have a problem with. But, um, but yeah, it just makes my head spin really trying to think about that, like the idea of keeping promises to an omniscient and omnipotent God. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I'll go next. Uh, well, obviously, every question you, you've got uh, your own personal uh, insights, uh, maybe based upon uh, your life's experiences. Uh, and these are valid ways of answering questions. Uh, and then, of course, we have the scriptures. What do the scriptures say? And hopefully, uh, if the scripture speaks then we have to concede the scriptures are right and I have to abide by that. Um, but I, I'm not familiar with anything in the scriptures that would really address this, 
the question of an oath or a promise, um, I, I think they are similar, but I, I think they're different. Uh, uh, but let me, let me uh, I, I answered um, leaning faults because uh, I certainly would, would not want to say faults that a person, how is it phrased should not or must not or how is that question? Could you read it again, Ben? Yeah. Uh, well, since I can't find scriptures that speak on it, I'm, I mean, I have to give you just my own imp uh, opinion. Um, I don't see any reason why a person uh, should not uh, make promises to God. Um, uh, so I would never uh, say to someone that they should not do that. Um, you know, uh, especially if, if you consider the, the desperate state that we sometimes reach, uh, uh, for example, extreme sickness or, or uh, some kind of extreme situation where you just need you need help uh, desperately. If you're desperate enough, I mean, I mean, I've felt quite quite desperate numerous times with where I'm uh, asking. Lord, uh, and begging the Lord, and I'm just desperate and even questioning the Lord, why, Lord, why, why is it that I'm not getting yes? Why in the world would you not grant me this? I'm so desperate for this, whatever the need is. Uh, when, when you reach a, a, a such a desperate or such a, um, place, uh, then I, I don't... I think it's pretty normal and natural for people to be willing to, you know, bargain with God, plead with God, make promises to God. I, I would not, uh, I don't see any reason why that, that should be uh, discouraged. Um, okay, Steve, what do you say? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's, I can't think of, a specific instance in the Bible where people made a promise to God and it ended well for them. Um, the one most uh, startling thing to me that, that I, that I thought of was when the law came in for the people of Israel that uh, they said to God, basically, I couldn't find the, the specific verse where they say this, but they, you know, basically ask, ask for God to tell them what to do, that they would do it and, and do it, you know, uh, do whatever God asks so that, so that God would dwell with them even though he had been dwelling with them all along. And I know it's somewhere between after they passed through the Red Sea and uh, chapter 32, where Moses brings the law down to the people that had already broken the law that God was giving to Moses to give to the people so that he would dwell with them. And they had already broken that law and that that day that Moses brought that law down because they were, they had made a graven altar, uh, a golden calf uh, um, to another God. They had already broken the first commandment and which was part of, you know, the 10 commandments that we talk about, but there was much more to the 10 commandments than just 10 commandments that Moses was given but those are the basic parts of it but anyway the point being that they had already broken it and that day 3,000 people died uh, they were destroyed because of their iniquity and it wasn't until that point that the law came in that anyone died up until that, no one had died, and God had been with them the whole time. 
from the parting of the Red Sea until the day the law was brought down from Mount Sinai. And the law was given because the people asked and basically made a promise to God that they would fulfill it perfectly. They would do it. And they didn't. And they died. And the coolest part about it is that then several thousand years later, I may be completely off on that number, but many, many hundreds of years later, Jesus came on the scene, fulfilling that law. And the day the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost and grace came back, even though it's all, we've always been saved by grace, but 3,000 people were made alive that same day. So law brings in death, which I believe is what a promise is. It's, it's you saying you will fulfill some requirement to, to receive something. And we know that by grace is not of us. So to make a promise to God, I do not think is wise. Uh, and I think also what Angel said is also true that we are told not to swear or to make a promise that you will do this or that. Even, even with that. The exact uh, word was vow. I paraphrase. Right? It's <clears throat> vow, but it's mm -hmm. the same as promise. Right, right. Yep. Uh, and also in Joshua, uh, Joshua chapter nine, uh, they had got kind of suckered into a, a making a, a treaty or a vow or a promise to a group of people who tricked them into thinking they had made some kind of long journey, uh, and and so they said, we will not, you know, go back on our word, because if we do, we would suffer the consequences of that. So that's also another example of why you don't make vows, especially to even to people without consulting the Lord. Um, there is one vow that I would say that we are to make is that of a husband and wife. Um, uh, and that, that is a vow that, that we should make and should keep and cherish and, and that God honors, um, because, you know, that's what we're, we are to do. And it demonstrates Christ's love to his church when we honor that correctly. And when you don't, there are as always consequences um, because it just is when you separate two, two things that have become one, there will be bleeding. What, even if it's not physical, it's spiritual, mental, emotional bleeding. And so that's why you should not break a promise or make a promise unless you are sure to complete it. Um, but, uh, I think it's one thing to say, there I go if God wills it, you know, mm -hmm. if God is willing, but Can we to go on leave to, it uh, in God's hands. Sorry. Yes. Can we go on to go uh, uh, Ben's answer and you can have more time yes. on the sure. follow-up? Sure. Go sorry. Ahead, go ahead, Ben. What do you say? Uh, well, you, you, Angel and uh, well, all, all you guys hit on things I wanted uh, to mention, and it's really funny because I was just looking at these verses for studying something else, um, but I, I agree that it's probably it's it's uh I don't think it's wise to make promises. I mean, after all, we to fulfill a promise, uh, it requires your strength essentially, or you know, you're relying on yourself somehow to do it to f to fulfill it. And why would you need to make a promise to God when we're not supposed to rely on our strength? We're supposed to rely on His strength and His will. Um, and uh. You know, for example, in Ecclesiastes, Angel mentioned this earlier, and it's funny, I was just looking at this verse. Uh, mm -hmm. It says, Ecclesiastes 5, it started with verse 4, it says, When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed, better not to vow than to vow and not pay. 
Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? So um, one of the things that this is teaching here, I believe, is that in Ecclesiastes, is that uh, don't make a, a, a vow in haste. This is the Old Testament, but don't make a vow in haste. And uh, when you do make it and you can't fulfill it, don't pretend like, oh, well, I, it was unintentional. I, it was, you know, it was a mistake. I didn't really, I didn't really mean it. Um, again, because uh, your word uh, is very sacred in it, uh, especially the Old Testament times, and it should be today for as, us as well. Um, but um, another, another verse says in Deuteronomy 23, uh, verse 21 through 23, or Deuteronomy 20, chapter 23, verses 21 through 23 says, When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not, de not delay to pay it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you. But if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be sin to you. So um, that that's a, a, a good principle, I think. Um, also, too, when Jesus, when, uh, Jesus was uh, talking to the Pharisees, or uh, actually, I'm sorry, to Israel in uh, Matthew 5, that's the same chapter where he's talking, where he's really amplifying the law, and he's saying, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. He uh, says, again, you have heard uh, that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall put perform your oaths to the Lord. And I believe that's basically a reference to Leviticus 19.12, uh, where God says, You shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall you profane the name of the thy, the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Uh, so any uh, Jew in, the, in that time taking God's name uh, with an oath would be bound to fulfill it. And uh, to break it would be breaking the third commandment. And, and it would also be taking the Lord's name in vain. And the Pharisees, for example, would take uh, their oaths in the name of other things um, so that their oaths were not binding. And so they used it for uh, really an occasion for lying. Um, whereas, again, the, the Bible teaches that uh, our vows should be considered sacred, uh, whether the lifetime vows, marriage covenants, like Steve mentioned, uh, temporary vows, uh, all vows are, are sacred to God. And um, uh, I'll keep it short for that for that purpose, but um, I think it's unwise to make uh, promises to God. Again, after all, He makes promises to us, and I can say much more, but I'll, I'll keep it. Uh, I'll keep it short for that for now. All right, thank you. The uh, uh, some of the answers uh, uh, were you cited um, the uh, the Ten Commandments and. Uh, Remember that Paul says that if we uh, if we uh, want to put ourselves under the law, then we're putting ourselves under a curse. Uh, we're not under the law. So we're certainly never are not today and never have been under the laws of Moses uh, as far as Gentiles who are not practicing Judaism. Uh, so I, I think that um, answering the question with uh, that in mind is a mistake because what you're doing is putting yourself uh, under the law again. Uh, so, but uh, who wants to uh, have a follow-up answer? I actually have something. Um, when Steve was talking about examples of people making promises to God, um, the story of Jephthah's daughter came to my mind. Um, if, in case anyone hasn't heard that story before, um, Jephthah made a promise to God that if God would give him victory over the Ammonites, that the first thing that came out of his house, he would sacrifice to the Lord as a burnt offering. And God gave him victory. And he went home. And the first thing that came out of his house was his daughter. And he mourned. And he said that his daughter had broken his heart. Um, and this is in um, Judges 11. Um, but um, she had broken his heart because he had made a promise to God and he had to keep it. So she, she asked for two months to go celebrate with her friends and to mourn for her virginity. And then she allowed herself to be sacrificed. Now, do I think that all promises to God 
would always end in death? No, I don't think so. But there are plenty of examples in the Bible and Jesus' own words in the Bible telling us that we should just let our yes be yes and our no, no. And that's also in Matthew 5 where Ben was referring to um, that I just, I don't see that it's wise to make a promise to God. Okay, thank you, sister. Uh, who else would like to have a follow-up answer? Well, if you don't mind, I'll go real quick because I didn't, I kind of cut myself short before I could say it. Yeah, my whole point of reciting the Old Testament was to say uh, promises is is a, 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 a you, yes, you are. You're basically putting yourself under the law. And I, that was my point. Uh, I can see your point as well, Luke. But my, I guess uh, what, I want to, what I wanted to draw out is what uh, Heather just said, whereas, which is, she said, uh, you know, what James 5, 12 says, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any o other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into hypocrisy. Um, and so, again, I don't think it, I don't think it's wise to promise to God something. It's like, again, it's his strength that would allow you to fulfill it anyways. So uh, I think it's good to express your intent and your desire of what you want to do. But uh, I wouldn't say, God, I'm going to do this or and if if I do this, you'll you'll if I do this, and I'm expecting you to do this for me. That was my point: is that you're you're basically placing yourself under the law. Um, you're it's a you're you're making you're bargaining and, and uh, bargaining with God, and uh, uh, and and again, He wants to give. He doesn't want you to. Uh, he doesn't want an exchange. He wants to you to lean uh, lean on Him and, and rest in Him, and uh, uh, again totally be dependent on him so there's no reason to promise he doesn't want you to he doesn't want uh he doesn't he's not depending on you you need to be dependent on him so that that was my point of citing the old testament law is that uh it, you basically are putting yourself under the curse uh whereas i'm not saying if you were to promise a god that you're under well y you are basically you put you are you put yourself under the curse essentially uh and again not a, not a loss of salvation but you've uh you've uh just like in Galatians, you essentially um, have become alienated from Christ because uh, you, you're not allowing the Spirit to work in you. You're relying on God to do it for you. Um, yeah. Uh, that, yeah, you really kind of summed up something I was having a hard time expressing, which was the um, the idea of like why, why why we're not in a position to bargain with him is because he only wants um, the best for us anyway. Like there's not really anything that we can offer him it's almost like we're um it, it it just sort of seems like a redundant thing because like uh, like how you explained it he wants to give anyway and really uh, you know i i understand people in in desperation i mean I, I don't think any of us are saying you better not i think the question was that you know whether it's a good idea um uh we're, we're not um going back to the law in the sense, well, if you do that, then, you know, like we're, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that uh, most of the time nothing happens because God is loving and he's merciful and he's not um, looking to punish us for, you know, these momentary, uh, like uh, these moments of, of just desperation and uh, of frustration where we might end up bargaining with them sort of that. I mean, I think it's natural for, I think a lot of people do it. Um, I've heard so many people talk about making these bargains with God. And I don't think that it's, uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm, I'm not promising or, 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 or warning anybody that, uh, that most likely it's going to end a disaster. I think the, just it, the question was, you know, should we like wh whether it's a good idea or not, like, not like, you know, uh, or something horrible will happen if you do it and you break the promise. But, um, I think it's just more, uh, uh, if you understand the, you know, the, the, the way God is and the relationship that we, you know, he wants with us. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I don't think that it's um, reflecting on anybody when they're in a, like in a really desperate situation. They're very afraid. I'm sure uh, I could even like, let's say, let's say like, you know, Joel was, uh, was on his deathbed or something, you know, I'm, I'm sure that I would find myself, you know, tempted to bargain with God. Right. right? Um, but there, and there have been times where I've, I, the thoughts entered my mind when something's not going the right way, I'm like really panicked about something, I'm really worried. But in those moments, 
um, I stopped myself because I realized he's right there with me. God's like in it with me. I don't have to promise him anything. He wants the best for me. And I might not understand exactly how he plans to bring that about, but I, I just, I just give myself over in that moment to trusting how much he loves me because of all the times I've seen him make these little gestures. I, I don't even know how to describe them. Some of them are so minute. Only he and I could understand because he's there in my thoughts. He, he'll, he'll, there's ways that, that God does things like all the time for me that show me that he's, that he's listening and that he, uh, that not even just listening, but like he, he sees me, um, completely right so even my own even little thoughts that I never actually speak aloud to anybody um God will uh do little things that um that show me that he's here for me by just the way something unfolds where uh uh like some some, let's say some hope that I'd never actually expressed to anyone and maybe really didn't form into words even in my own mind when he brings something about in my life, he'll add this little detail where only he could have known that. Right. And that shows like that deep personal um, uh, bond uh, that, that he wants with us and that, and you know, that he's like the best friend that we, uh, (laughs) we could only ever imagine the best friend and the best father all rolled up into one. And we, we would never even think it was possible um, to, to even hope for. And that's God. That's, that's the best way I can put it. So for me, it just um, feels, like uh and it feels like it like kind of cheapens the the relationship a little bit to bargain with him knowing that he's this altruistic god who who doesn't actually benefit like he doesn't he doesn't get anything out of this bargain it's really like um we're the only one that could stand to benefit from whatever we're promising him in the first place right because uh we're you know abstaining from doing something that's bad for us or choosing to do something that's that's good which in turn is good for us anyway so it's really kind of like a a redundant bargain uh it's not like you know there's a real equal give and take with when it comes to like our our holy creator god so but uh, i'm not condemning anybody that does it like i said depending on the situation i've even been tempted to do it and it's not that i'm afraid oh no if i do that he might kill me or i don't i don't ever think that was god i just uh i i you know I realized that um, maybe if I were in his position, I would maybe a little offended if somebody did that, thinking that I would need them to bargain, uh, bargain with me in order for me to do something uh, good for them or to to save their butt in a really bad situation or, or to you know uh, or, or say, spare a loved one. You know what I mean? Um, I you know I don't I, I think that uh, I could understand if God would be a little offended that we would think that we need to give him something in order for him to do that for us. But again, it's totally understandable when people do this. Uh, I, I I just want to make myself clear. I'm not uh, judging anybody for doing this, but we're asked the question if we think it's a good idea, and I think. Um, I just don't think, you know, uh, hopefully I've expressed why, why I don't, you know, think maybe it's what God ultimately would, you know, hope we do in that situation. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make two follow-up questions. Uh, actually, this question's turned out to be better uh, as we've been discussing it than I initially thought. Uh, so, Nate, uh, thanks for the questions, uh, making us all think. Uh, but... Uh, Chris Annie asked uh, a question in the, uh, that we want to, we should probably respond to. But I, my follow up for everybody is, um, I I told you just a little bit about how um, there are times where you reach such a horrible state of desperation, uh, and this has happened to me quite a bit the last uh, ten years. You know, it's like I I got to the point where I'm asking the Lord, why am I uh, it, it continue to, to uh, have all these problems? I had to have brain surgery, and, and I had to have a back surgery. I mean, I, I was basically semi-paralyzed and couldn't, was in a wheelchair, and then I got back surgery to fix it, and everything went wrong with, with that. I had to have three back surgeries in seven days, and then I had a whole year of follow-up problems, every complication and problem you can have. And I'm at this point where I'm thinking and praying and weeping and, and desperate, Lord, are you even there? Are you, are you, I mean, I didn't, I didn't really doubt that the Lord was there. I didn't lose my faith, but I'm just at the point where, come on, what, everybody's praying for me. I'm, I'm, I'm praying and, and uh, it just gets worse. It's, 
there's no let up another problem another problem on top of another uh, am i the only one that's gone through this kind of a thing maybe it's because i'm almost twice everybody else's age i hope as you grow older you don't have to go through these things but when you when you do when you reach that 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 um feeling of being so desperate you're so miserable like i'd rather i'd rather not continue living is is how bad it actually gets that uh, i my quality of life is so bad that i don't want to go on and and I, thankfully nobody here i guess has, has ever experienced those things but have you experienced anything where you've you've uh, uh and that's why I'm relating to the promise. You, you'll promise God, you'll plead with God, you'll beg, you'll question God, you'll challenge him. You'll even say, are you even there? What are you, are you listening? Come on. Uh, so uh, that's my follow-up to everybody. And then uh, after that, we, we uh, Chris Annie asked something about, uh, let me see. Um, she says, uh, what about example of Hannah in 1 Samuel? So but first, if everybody would, uh, um, give me your, your thoughts on the point I just made. Yes. Um, I have been in that position. Um, I prayed for 15 years to have a baby. Um, and I know that that might not sound really, I don't know, as, as impacting as what you were talking about for you, brother Luke, but any woman who's ever been through infertility will understand this. And proof of that is hannah with samuel she was so desperate and she wanted a baby so badly and for me i wanted a baby so badly and i kept seeing my friends around me get pregnant and oh the desperation of i've been praying where are you why are you not answering me and the answer was always not now and i, and I did not understand it and then my ex-husband had an affair and got the girl pregnant in a month and I ended up divorced and I understood the wisdom of not having a child with him and then I moved here and I met my husband who would not have even given me the time of day if I had kids and I have two beautiful children. After 15 years of praying, I prayed for one. And God gave me two beautiful little boys who are so smart. Liam is only three and he already knows his alphabet. He can count. It's insane how smart these little boys are and how much of a blessing they are. And Christopher, I have seen the Holy Spirit speak through him and i have seen wisdom beyond his little eight years come out of him when he says mom the show that liam's watching is not inappropriate because i had stopped paying attention for about five minutes and he heard something that was remotely inappropriate and he comes and says it's inappropriate we need to change it and right away it's like okay and i i trust him because i know that he's, he's got his brother's best interest at heart. And I know that he's saved and I've seen the Holy Spirit work through him. And why did I have to go through 15 years of infertility? Why did I have to go through a divorce? Because God knew that there would be women that he was going to bring across my path who would need to hear my story. Women who are single and want to be married women who are married and desperately want to have children. He needed me to go through that. And it's hard. It was so hard, but he's used me because of it. And I, he's helped me to minister into other women's lives because of it. In fact, um, there is a baby <laughs> that just turned two months old that was a frozen embryo because his mother was doing, um, in vitro fertilization because of fertility issues. And this, this embryo was frozen because they had a child and she didn't want to get rid of the embryo. She felt like that would be wrong. So, but she didn't know any doctors here cause she had just moved here. And I sent her to my doctor who is the leading fertility specialist in North Carolina. 
and he was able to to use that embryo and that little baby is two months old now because the lord used the my example through what i had gone through okay thank you sister you answered both questions um anybody else that was answer? beautiful heather yeah um steve do you, do you want to have a follow-up and, and answer my question and and uh, uh anything else uh sure <clears throat> Uh, I'll start off with just to make sure I wasn't misunderstood on my first answer to the to the question that I was I was definitely not saying to to uh, put put yourself under the law or anything like that. And that I think that oftentimes when people do make promises to God, they put themselves under a law of their own uh, of their own making. <clears throat> um, and you know, because most of the time when you, when you make a promise to God, you say, God, if you'll do X, Y, and Z, then I'll do X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, and, and, and very few times do people actually follow through with what they promised God that they would do. And there's usually a consequence for that. Now, if a saved person does that, is their salvation in jeopardy? No. If a saved person off says, you know, uh, promises God to, to give them their life in service to him, uh, w do they lose their salvation? No. Um, in fact, it, it's not even their life anymore after being saved. You know, that's why it says, uh, you know, you have been bought with a price, that price being Christ's blood. Therefore, honor God with your body. Um, and this is kind of relating to, to the question and to some things in the chat that I saw. But but back to the, the question. So, uh, yes. I've been there. I am sure a lot of people have been there. And did I follow through most of the time? No. Did I have consequences? Yeah. Um, can I think of specific examples? No. But it is God's love that does that type of chastening. And it's, you know, uh, Sometimes it can seem harsh at the time, and sometimes it can be uh, the wisdom of God, like Heather was saying, to 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 wait to give you something you are asking for. Um, I heard that re that reminded me of a sermon I heard, which was titled "God Loved Me Enough to Be Late." Was he late according to his own timing? No. Was he late according to my timing? Yes. And I think that's the same uh, thing with what Heather was saying. And the, with, with that in mind, with the verse in, or the part in for Samuel about Hannah, who did make a promise to God and did fulfill her end of the promise. And that was that if God would open her womb and allow her to be pregnant, that she would give her firstborn child to the Lord. And she did. She got pregnant and gave her firstborn child to the Lord to to be in service to him. Um, and I, I, uh, I see a distinct difference there um, between offering your child for the Lord's use and service and the one that promised the first thing that will come out of my house, I will give as a burnt offering and sacrifice because... Uh, you know, I think that person didn't truly understand that God actually says in his word that he does not desire the burnt offerings and sacrifices, but he would rather, much rather have one who will serve and worship him. Um, and w just going back to the whole give your life thing, in a sense, when you do believe and are saved, you have given your life to Christ because it's no longer your own until you make that uh, 
until you accept that truth for you and believe it and and receive it you haven't you've you've technically given up your life to christ when you believe in him is it the way that that's completely different than the way most lordship or quote unquote people say it they mean it in duty and doing and that kind of a promise quote unquote and that is not the gospel the gospel is that christ saves you not yourself but when you do believe you have given up your life to christ because you believe because now that payment has bought you and you're no longer your own and that's why we are supposed to honor god with our life and all those things and so we should do and let our yes be yes and yet let our nay be nay is it is it a wrong thing to say to god if you do this i'll do that I would say no, but I would also say it's dangerous to do so because if you don't follow through, there could be consequences. But God is still merciful and gracious even when we do those kinds of things. And yes, people make those kinds of promises all the time. And most of the time, if you'll ask them what happened when they didn't keep their promise to God, that it didn't usually end well for them, but that God still was merciful and gracious, even in him doing what they asked, you know, and I've seen that a lot. So I would just say, live your life in honor to God as best you can and let your yay be yay and nay be nay. Thanks. Okay, amen. Um, well, let me scrub away my shirt while I'm thinking about it here. All right. Did you um, want all of us to an answer that question or just uh, whoever wanted to? I'm I I'd like everybody who'd like to answer it, but first let me just look at this. Can you yeah, see? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. See yes, yes, <laughs> yes. You I did forget one thing with the Hannah thing, if I can take two two minutes. All right, let me not make, even two minutes, one minute, 30 let me, seconds. <laughs> yeah, but let me make my point about the robe here. If you look at this, I'm sure that Heather has on hers. Nice. This That's is our, nice. This is, are you all wearing your robe of righteousness tonight? Everybody? Okay, go ahead, Steve. Okay. Um, I was going to say uh, with, with the whole Hannah thing that she gave her, her child to God, her son to God, and God did open up her womb. And she did have, I think it was Heather, Heather Crisani uh, mentioned in the chat that, you know, she had went on to have three more children <laughs> after that. Um, but Heather, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, Heather made a very good point that, uh, although that was a beautiful and wonderful thing, she didn't get to really r raise her child and have her child in the home. She had to give up that child basically for all of his life. Sure, she got to see him and all that, but basically uh, she didn't, you know, uh, get to keep him and raise him and nurture him like any mother would want to do. And so it was very much a living sacrifice uh, to God. And I'm sure she had some times of loss with that and feelings of loss there. So it wasn't like in keeping her promise, she didn't give up something. And that I'm sure was painful at times, even with the three children. I think Heather said, three children having three more children doesn't replace the one you had to give up to God to have the three. So, you know, it's a beautiful thing. Yes. But it didn't come without sacrifice. Thanks. Um, um, that was it. 
Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm I'm dodging between the kids. So whenever I get a moment, I try to answer while I can because like they're, they're it's a little bit noisy here. But um, so I I want to point out. So I've only been saved just a, a few years now, and strangely, although I have actually had um some really uh very very difficult uh, life experiences. It was all like leading up to my salvation. Like it was, you know, I, I've mentioned this a lot, you know, my, uh, most of my family died within the span of one year when I also became a mom, for, you know, and um, I'm sure had I been saved at the time, <laughs> there might have might have been some bargaining going on or, um, you know, to be honest, uh, in a lot of these situations, I didn't even have warning. So I don't know that I would have had um a moment even to to uh, bargain with God unless I would be trying to be bargaining with him to like resurrect them these were all very sudden things that happened um but um so why I see that's the thing since I've uh, since I've been saved it's he has blessed me so uh so generously in so many ways I I almost well, were I can it always it can't it can't go on like this forever I mean we've had things we go through things but um you know I, honestly I guess with my child uh when my my little my little, she's now one, she just turned one, went to, had to be rushed to the uh, hospital up in Indianapolis um, for, uh, she, she had a stuffy nose, but it was causing labored breathing. And she was actually, uh, uh, she, a couple of times she stopped breathing. And that was the scariest thing that had ever happened to me, especially since I got saved, but just in general period in my life, um, I had never dealt with anything like that with my children where they were in an emergency situation like that. And also uh, she wasn't, uh, they had to transport her separate from me. They wouldn't let me ride in the ambulance. So I had to make this hour drive uh, with my little newborn. She was only four weeks old um, in an ambulance with strangers. I, I don't, I don't hand my kids off. You know, I don't, uh, I homeschool. I don't, I don't, uh, tr- I don't trust doctors very much. So this was a very difficult experience for me. Um, and I, I try to think, did I, I don't remember if I if I bargained with God. It would have been, it would have been a natural reaction. Here's the thing for me, I am like I had a really bad problem with magical thinking and like kind of OCD type behaviors, especially when I was lost, to where it got like like you know jinxing and and weird things. It got really obsessive um and uh you know kind of it was very stressful really because I I would get to the point where if I missed a, if I missed a green light I was sure that like my boyfriend was going to die or something like something new. Like I would make all these crazy like bargains and bets with, and I was an unbeliever at the time. So who, who knows what, uh, but I, I, and I would see, it would seem that sometimes these like uh, jinxes uh, or like a ritualist, like kind of like the OCD ritual behavior where you think if you don't go back and pet your cat two more times that um, when you come back home, he's going to be gone and missing well, one time I actually did that. Like I had the urge, oh, better go pet. I better go get out of my car and go back into my house and pet my cat one more time um, or he's going to be missing. And I think that demons do this because somehow that cat, although he had never really, he'd never gone missing ever before. We barely got outside. When I, I got home from rollerblading, yes, rollerblading, and he was missing and he was missing all night long. And it looked like he, he turns out he got trapped in a garage overnight. Um, like one of our neighbor's garages, but so that those kind of things would self-perpetuate to where I would, I would start to think they were real, like th- these like weird little jinxes and this OCD type thinking was real. There's, yeah, there's something to it, you know? And I think it was honestly at the time, I think it was like for demons playing tricks on me to where it would just perpetuate my, my OCD. But so that's another reason that I, I, I don't do the bargaining thing because um, I remember uh, how I had a problem with that type of thinking before. And um, so I, I, you know, I don't think I'm any stronger than anybody else. I think that that's probably why I didn't, didn't bargain with God um, with my, you know, in the situation with my daughter. Uh, it's mainly because I've had just bad experiences in the past when I, when I didn't believe God existed and still managed to be bargaining with something <laughs> or just the universe, I guess. And, um, you know, it didn't, it, it, it kind of led to a kind of madness, really. Um, and, um, and I love that, uh, now that I know God and I know, uh, the spirit of the Lord, I, you know, I understand it's not really how things work, you know, and it's not like step on a crack, break your mother's back. Right. And I think that probably these illustrations in scripture where, um, these bad things befall people who do break promises to God. I don't think it's so much that God wants us to be 
uh, worried that, you know, we're under the law and that there's just a consequence. I think it's more as a, as a, as a lesson um, to, to the, like what kind of spirit he wants us to operate in and like the nature of the relationship he would like for us to have. And in, in a lot of these situations, it seems that, um, you know, I, I don't think God's really going to judge us too much when, when we're desperate and we're mad with pain, like not even in our right mind from pain and, you know, and surgeries and just this like chronic illness. Uh, I, you know, I'm sure that uh, God totally understands. I also know that even as an unbeliever, when I was losing uh, loved ones left to right, um, you know, in sudden unrelated ways in that, you know, year span, um, I thought I didn't believe in God, but I was sure quick to curse him openly with my mouth once it got to be too much to where I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I couldn't deny that there was some force at work that was greater than probability because there was no statistical probability. I mean, it was astronomical of the things that happened. And I do believe that God always has, has a reason for why he does things because that is how I was broken to the point where I actually finally realized why we need to have answers about why we exist and, and have some guarantee of some greater meaning to all of this and a promise of eternity. Um, especially like with these people that we, we love so much in our lives, our family, our children. Um, and, and, uh, and I wanted to also say what Heather said, you know, I, you're like the inverse of me because, uh, in my situation, um, I, uh, you know, my, my husband, we had, uh, dated in my, when I was 20 and he didn't want to, he thought, he just thought I was like a teeny bopper. Right. So he, he, he didn't want a serious relationship with me. He, he, I was a little bit younger than him and he typically dated old, women a little bit older than him because he just didn't like immaturity. And um, somehow, <laughs> uh, it, it wasn't until I was a, a single mother, um, of, you know, with my, my first daughter, who, who's, you know, biological father, uh, just basically abandoned us. Um, and she was nine months old, that Joel, this man I had pined for for nine years at that point, and the only guy I couldn't really get, he was just, uh, uh, I never stopped loving him, uh, some, just by chance, came back into my life you know, we lived in totally different states at that point. And the weird thing is, um, he had been married and he had been trying to have a child, uh, with his ex-wife. Uh, uh, he had been married, you know, he had been divorced from her for about a year and they couldn't have a baby. I mean, they, you know, they, they didn't know why, but they had been trying and it never happened. Um, and, um, he had always thought he was infertile, like most of his life. Uh, he just assumed that he was, and, um, he just didn't think he could have children. And uh, uh, the weird thing is normally, uh, I would think, you know, a man in his right mind can't be blamed for not wanting to, to go for, especially, a, you know, a 28 year old single mom with nothing but debt and seven cats <laughs> and, uh, and uh, an MIA, uh, you know, uh, fiance, uh, a baby daddy, as they call it today. I, you know, you wouldn't really blame a guy for not wanting anything to do with somebody like that, right? Well, um, somehow, in this unique situation and on God's timing, that that was a situation which Joel finally uh, took me seriously. Like something about me being in that situation, having a child, was um, where he could see me differently. Like see me as a woman. He he respect. He knew what I had been going through, and uh, he fell in love with me. <laughs> finally, like uh, it had been unrequited for so long, and um, uh, that was the last thing I was looking for. I wasn't even looking. I mean, I I thought I was single for life. I couldn't even imagine trusting some man with my daughter uh if i couldn't even trust her father right he couldn't even trust him not to walk out on her why would i why would i trust anybody else right but joel would have been the only person i ever would have trusted because you know we'd always stayed in touch and i just had the utmost respect for him and his integrity and just god orchestrated all of that and it was all on his timing see if joel had had a child with his ex-wife he would never ever have i mean i mean she divorced him anyway it wasn't even man he had no say in the matter but um hardly it was, it was really weird how it happened but um uh, he would have he would have you know stayed with her for life whatever whatever it took he would never have abandoned his child so we would never have been together and um we have you know three more children now and uh uh that was the you know right before i got saved at all you know that god brought us back together and um this was how one way that god showed me he'd been there all along right because um only he could have really known how much i loved joel and how how he could have been the only person in the whole world that would have 
that could have picked me up in that situation. The only person I would have trusted, and um, we have the most incredible relationship that I've never seen anywhere else. I've never seen people as happy as we are together. And so uh, I just love your story because uh, it's, it seems to happen in a bit of an opposite way, but it's the same exact way that God operates, where at the end of it, you realize why everything happened the way it did. And it's so, it's, um, it's like a, he's almost like winking at you throughout the whole situation, like showing you um, that, that he knows the deepest wishes of your heart, right? So, um, and he, he brings them about in his own time. And, uh, and what's really amazing is to me, um, the way that he did this in my life, uh, it was to lead me unto him because he knew once I saw the series of events play out in my life, I would not be able to deny that there was, that there was a, not only a force, a greater force at work that I initially blamed for my misfortune with my family, um, the death of my family, but then he showed me his grace and his just uh, loving kindness so that um, once I realized he was really there, he could show me, he could show me just a, just what a loving um, and understanding God that he is. And also all the people that I lost in my family, they were all believers, like saved believers. So I'm not trying to suggest that, uh, that he'll just kill innocent people uh, just to try to, you know, finally reach me to where I, <laughs> where, where I finally believe. No, but the, everything was a plan. And these people were people in my life. I've probably been praying for me my whole life, my family, if I was an unbeliever and a little atheist since seven. And so this is kind of how we ended up answering their prayers. But, um, you know, I know we'll be together in eternity. And so God has a reason for all that he does. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, but I, I do understand Luke. I mean, I'm dreading any situation where I am uh, unable to, to function as normal. Like, you know, I'm, uh, as I grow older, like having chronic pain issues. I mean, I, I, and, and just, you know, chronic illness, uh, uh, my heart goes out to you, man, and I'm, I'm not ju- I'm not judging you for reaching that breaking point at all because it, it's totally natural. And like I said, I probably would have too, but because of my past experience with this whole OCD stuff, it just wards me off from from uh, any type anything that feels too much like a bargaining, jinxing OCD type behavior. Well, wow, that's uh, very good. I, uh, I'm really happy to hear that good report about you and Joel. Um, yeah. ben, um, before we go on, what would you like to add any more to your answer? Uh, well, just a couple things. Um, the uh, again, I I, I I I personally would not recommend making any promises to God. Uh, I would let your petition be made before Him. Let you know He knows your heart, uh, and and it's up to Him. And even with uh, Hannah, you know, I see a lot of allusions to uh, well, Christ first of all. And you know, right off the bat, he, uh, when she was uh, when she made her vow, uh, her husband said to her, uh, "Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better that, to you than ten sons?" And I think again, that's an allusion to the law. Her husband, uh, it kind of is like a picture of the law, uh, Ten Commandments. Um, and again, her petition to God was, uh, "God." Uh, you know, should you, uh, she was relying on his grace. Like, should you, should you grant, do this gracious thing for me? I will uh, uh, be gracious back to you essentially. And it's a picture of uh, Christ, I, I believe in his, uh, you know, virgin birth. Um, you know, it's, an, it's that he's, he was a Nazarite, uh, uh, um, Samuel was. So, um, no, wait, no. Yeah. Um, so the. Yeah, so that's one thing I would say, you know, I, I would be, you know, if, if I made a promise to God, I would say, okay, God, that was a really a foolish thing for me to do. Um, uh, you know, I, and, and I, I'm I relying on your grace and, and let, and, you know, let your will be done. Um, so if you, it's something you've done, I don't think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just that I think if you, if you're depending on it happening, uh, based on your, your performance, uh, to fulfill that vow, again, you, you've fallen from grace, I believe. And again, this picture in the Old Testament is really uh, illustrating a principle of just really having integrity with your vows, uh, you know, and, and just generally what righteousness looks like. That's what the law does. It, it, it get, guides us, gives us principles of what righteousness uh, looks like. Uh, but we can't, again, we can't achieve it. So uh, I wouldn't look at a lot of Old Testament uh, 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 instances to uh, uh, 
for wh wh how we should, uh, you know, conduct ourselves with, with regards to vows. But I, I'd be the first to admit that, uh, especially as an unsafe person, uh, I'm in a really high stakes job a lot of times, and I break a lot of rules. Frankly, like I'm not supposed to. Uh, I'm not supposed to touch customers' computers and things like that, but a lot of times they're so slow and there's a height. It's a, it, you know, I'm staying up all night to do something and they're really slow and it's like, all right, just move aside, let me get on the keyboard and I'll, I'll do it, get it done ten times faster. At the same time, that that makes me, um, uh, culpable or liable for if anything goes wrong. And I, I things have gone wrong, uh, and you know, t millions of dollars are at stake. A lot of people's jobs are at stake, and uh, any mistakes I made, you know, it's it comes down on me. So I, I, I've definitely have been very desperate. Um, and I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever actually said, God, if you do this, uh, I'll do, I'll do this for you. But I've definitely cried out to him and said, please, God, get me out of the situation. So I, I can understand that as well. So I'm not saying I'm anything special. Um, but I, you know, one thing it's again, with the, while it, what's it, I think an interesting lesson is, you know, before uh, Israel even went in, uh, under the law, God tested them essentially. Where He was uh, delivered them. He, he sent uh, Moses. You know, He graciously sent Moses to free them. Uh, you know, He He uh, split the the Red Sea graciously. He drowned Pharaoh's arm, arm, uh, uh, army graciously. And then, uh, but Israel failed to see um, as they again coming out of Egypt. They failed to see God's grace. And it actually says in Exodus 15, and this is where the whole law started, essentially. It says Exodus 15, 22, it says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of, that, of, of it was called Mara, which means bitter. And the people complained against Moses, saying, "What shall we drink?" So again, uh, they 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 saw miracle after miracle after miracle, and um, they were grumbling against Moses, uh, which essentially, you know, it, it's it's really grumbling against God because they knew that He was sent by God. And uh, so, right then and there, God. Uh, so they cried out to to the to Moses, cried out to the Lord. And by the way, at any time. Uh, that before great grace can really be shown to people, I, oftentimes uh, they, God doesn't need to bring them to a place where it's actually absolutely desperate and they do need to cry out for him. So M Moses cried out to the Lord and Lord, the Lord showed him a tree and he cast it into waters and the waters were made sweet. And then uh, right there it says, there he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them and said, if you diligently hear, heed, again, this is before Sinai, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And so, right there you see the law coming into play. So, they were testing God. They were putting God essentially on trial by complaining to Moses. And so, again, that's a law principle. They they fell from grace. They, they, they started complaining against him. Like they they've been delivered up to that point so far, they should have been realizing that you know God was a God of grace, and yet they were putting to the test, and they were putting him on trial essentially, and so because they were testing him by complaining uh, that he was not providing for them with water, uh, God immediately put them under a test and said, okay, if you and again right before he did that, a after they complained, he 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 made the water sweet, so it's an another reminder of his grace, but then. Uh, then he immediately comes with the law, and they should have said, you know, why, why are you treating us uh, like the Egyptians, who are your enemies? You're going to put all these diseases which you brought on the Egyptians? Why are we now your enemies? Because they become his enemies because they had become alienated from his grace. And um, and that's why the whole, t the, old, uh, the whole covenant came into place, because they failed to see his grace. So it was their choice to uh, slip and fall from his grace. And that's why I think we also should not do that. And that's why we should not be making promises to God. We should be relying on his promises to us, which is, uh, you know, his love and his uh, care for us. He always has our best interest in mind, always. Okay, thank you, Ben. I guess everybody's uh, had uh, plenty of time to answer. So uh, can shall we go to the next question? I think so. 
Okay, the next question is... This is for Bia Pratt. This was a couple weeks ago, but finally getting around to it. It says, uh, true or false, the Bible is a self-help book of positive affirmations for self-esteem and promises of prosperity. Okay, and uh, did anybody on the panel uh, offer the question? No, it's, it was from an, someone in the audience a couple weeks ago. Okay, all right then. Um... Let's, uh, Heather, would you like to go first? I would say false, but with a, a um, side note. Um, I would say that while the Bible does um, help us to live our lives in a better way, um, and that it teaches us ways that can be blessings to our lives. So in that way, kind of make us a, have a better life. Um, I would say that it's not, that's not the sole purpose of it. I think that the, per the main purpose of the Bible is to teach us who God is and the, to teach us the things that he wants for us. Um, I think that those are just blessings that come along with reading it. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, Sister Angel. I'll keep it quick. I'll say, if you're reading it right, you know, <laughs> if you're, I, I, I my, my little girl interrupted while you're reading the question a little bit. Um, but I think the gist of it was the Bible is a self help book full of positive affirmations to make you feel better about yourself, something like that, like a lot of these. Uh, I don't know, Joel Steen types preach. And I would say not, not in the way that they, they claim that it is, which is basically that there is no, um, that the Bible doesn't actually lay out absolutes about what, what, what God hates and what he loves and, you know, right and wrong. And, and don't ever, because what they talk about is really more like, don't examine yourself. Don't judge, uh, don't judge yourself, which God expressly tells us to do, to, you know, which is how we end up judging righteous judgment because we don't judge hypocritically. Right. Um, and we, we look at the beam in our own eye um, yeah, first. And so but I would say that uh, if you're reading it with the uh, I guess you may call them grace goggles on. Absolutely. The Bible is actually full of uh, <laughs> full of positive affirmations about just how much God loves us and uh, and how it had, you know, our salvation, our eternal fate, you know, the ultimate uh, wish uh, for <laughs> for all of mankind, which, you know, this idea of immortality and happily ever after, uh, you know, has nothing to do with, um, with our performance and all to do with God's glory and his mercy and his love, uh, for us. And, uh, and that all we have to do is, is rely on that completely, uh, uh, you know, uh, for, for our hope, for, uh, the promise of an eternity with him. So, um, to me, I mean, I can't imagine a more positive affirmation, but uh, uh, today they try to make us all very self-absorbed. They tell us that what we need is we, we need to love ourselves more. We need, um, you know, to, oh, they're screaming, um, that we, uh, that we don't love ourselves enough. That's, that's what we hear now. We need to, we need to forgive ourselves and love ourselves and, and, uh, and, and, and no matter what state you're in, no matter, you know, you know how healthy you are no matter what you're great you're just exactly as you're supposed to be and you're not only supposed to to not uh not question yourself or judge yourself but you you, you should be uh, prideful and actually hostile to anybody that might suggest that you have room for improvement um it's a, just about you know a hate crime now you know to no matter what 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 it is people people uh I just want their ears tickled and it's just turned into a, a complete, uh, everybody's just navel gazing. So self-absorbed. <laughs> it's, it, you know, people don't even want to have children now um, in my generation because uh, whether they'll admit it or not, really what it is is like, I mean, I remember I, when I was this way, I, I, I couldn't imagine a worse idea. <laughs> what do you mean? I don't want to, well, that sounds like a terrible idea. I've, that just, what, I, it's not all about me anymore. Like guaranteed, if I have a child, like I don't get to be number one. And that just sounds like, why does anybody do that? I, I remember they're loud and annoying. I, I couldn't understand it, right? And, and I think that's what people are looking for because that's the spirit everybody's operating in now, even when they do have children, sadly. 
um, people are selfish and it's glorified. Uh, look at all of the commercials. It's crazy the way they advertise to us now. I don't know who they're talking to. Like, who's this going to appeal to? But unfortunately, it appeals to a lot of people. All this, I mean, I, I was looking on the packaging of something I, uh, something that was like some type of, um, this was like make your eyes less puffy, uh, some like roller thing, right? And and I looked at the packaging um, once I opened it and like the little insert in there, it was just a, a pink piece of paper that said, you're flawless. Like, that's how they advertise people now. Like, like, that's, like, to me, like, even as a lost person, that would have nauseated me. This, this just empty, vapid affirmations of positivity that are not honest or objective, have no weight whatsoever, just, just brainless positivity. It's really just negativity. It's vacuous and lonely and empty when you get down to the bottom of it. And that's not what the Bible teaches at all. But if people could be honest and or at least if people could um, see through the lies and realize what we're really looking for. Um, it's not unconditional love from the world and from people to where, where we think we have, that people have no right to put any condition whatsoever on how they love and celebrate us as, as individuals. We're, we're supposed to celebrate ourselves in today's society, which is just madness to me. Uh, watching some movie for the kids, like a troll movie, and one of the songs was, like the lyrics were basically, we're celebrating ourselves or something like celebrating ourselves celebrate yourself i can't imagine something more backwards and twisted than that mindset where we're, you're actually celebrating yourself i always thought I, I always thought there was something weird about this idea of preaching self-love all the time but i eventually started to think maybe there was something to it because i didn't think you're supposed to hate yourself either and so as a lost person, I thought the opposite of that must be self-love, but I could never, something never felt right about it. Like, no, I don't, I'm just going to be neutral about myself <laughs> as best as possible. <laughs> maybe that's the key, like not to, not to do either one, not maybe not to be so self-absorbed would be the key. Um, but uh, if you actually read the Bible and understand the gospel, you understand that, um, that, you know, the good news is it's not about you. Uh, uh, today that's not uh, you know not very much appreciated at all I know it never really has been people's pride has always uh, has always blocked them from from receiving uh, the good news and um, but to me it, it really if you look at that question without having that attached to it then yeah of course it's it's uh it is you know positive affirmations about what a great a wonderful God we have and that he guarantees us uh, happily ever after literally beyond our wildest imaginations it's not even possible for us to to even glimpse or or even uh even uh get a hint of uh the things he has prepared for us and so those are those are very positive affirmations but it's not about ourselves you know it's about god and his love for us regardless of ourself right so I, I guess I, I guess the way the question was phrased, I would say false, right? <laughs> uh, but like I said, my my little uh, seven year old interrupted the question, so hopefully I answered it right. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, uh, brother Steve, what do you say? Oh boy, <laughs> um, I would say that to the shortest answer is. Yes and no. Um, uh, Self-help, self-esteem, um, and promises of prosperity are in the Bible. Um, self-help and promises of prosperity. Uh, there's three books that come to mind w with that in mind. Uh, Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Um, that are uh, there's also some in Joshua and everything, uh, but uh, you know Psalms one, so, Psalm Psalms chapter one uh, is is a you know great example of a promise of prosperity that, uh, but most people take a lot of these verses out of context and they are thinking materialistic only and although that may be true uh 
that you, you know, uh, if you follow these principles that are laid out in the Bible, yes, you can have prosperity in this life. But as has been said, the number one point of scripture, Jesus says it himself. Uh, I think it's John, it's in John. I'm pretty sure it's verse 35 and maybe perhaps chapter seven. I'm not sure. But the, the verse is that he's speaking to the Pharisees. He says uh, uh, that uh, they think they have eternal life because they know the scriptures. I'm paraphrasing. But he says the whole point of the scriptures is to point them to him. And so the whole point, according to Jesus of scripture is to get us to Christ. Does that mean that those things aren't in the Bible? No, uh, it certainly does not. The, yes, there are lots of things that can be helpful to yourself uh, in scripture. Um, and if, as, as long as you are not doing these things to serve mammon and, and to love money, as long as that's not your purpose, then yes, you can prosper in this life. But as someone said, uh, uh, kind of alluded to this in the chat and also one of the best, uh, quotes on this from one of my favorite preachers uh, said this true prosperity or true wealth is to be washed in the blood of the lamb to have the fruit of the spirit love joy peace patience kindness goodness gentleness and self-control um and, and so that's true prosperity because we know that that those especially our eternal life is eternal prosperity um, and, and with the self-esteem thing and with the self-love thing that was mentioned yes we are to love ourselves uh, and and that goes against the grain with a lot of people but God did say to love your neighbor as yourself is part of fulfilling uh, the the law but Jesus already fulfilled that, but that doesn't mean we aren't to try to do that. And God, it also says we love, we love because God first loved us. When we understand his love towards us and how he feels about us as saved people. And sometimes it can cause someone to be saved, to believe is they understand the depth of love of God for them. And, you know, desire to to receive that love and walk in that love after that. So that's how you learn to love yourself is first to understand the depth of the love of God toward you, that he has numbered even the hairs on your head, it, that his thoughts toward you are greater than the n number of the grains of sand that that he died for you, that he thought you worth it to, to die on a cross and shed his blood so that he could have a relationship with you if you want it. And once you do have that and learn more about that love, you, you can then love others with the love you received. And in so doing, in, in so doing, learn that self-esteem, that love for yourself, because you understand that you were loved by God. Forgiving yourself was brought up. Yes, that's important. All forgiveness is important because it, it stops the people that have harmed you, including yourself, from including that to, to you're giving that over to God so that you are no longer having to bear that weight. And that's why we're to put on the yoke of Christ in our, in our walk and everything. But yeah, it, there are companies that use that are, that are led by non-believers that use the book of Proverbs for their business models because it works. 
these are promises of God that if you do X, Y, and Z, you'll get X, Y, and Z. But they lay up for themselves treasures that will be eaten up by, by rust and moths. Basically, this world will destroy the work of man's hands. But I did want to read one verse in Ecclesiastes just to prove uh, a little bit here. Ecclesiastes 3, 12, and 13, which was written by by Solomon, one of the wisest people that lived, who also said all of these things are meaningless without God, to paraphrase what he says, but Ecclesiastes 3, 12, and 13. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. So, you know, Solomon there even says that we can enjoy things in this life and that we should work hard for those things and enjoy the fruit of our labor. But our number one thing, as it says in the New Testament, to do all that we do for the glory of God. Thank you. Okay, thank you, brother. A lot of excellent points were made. Uh, I, I think we could all agree that uh, the points that were uh, mentioned in the question, uh, it is true that the Bible does have instructions on all those things. But uh, that's, that's a small part of what the Bible is. Um, I'm going to answer now in, in, in a way that um, uh, for those people who haven't read the Bible or studied the Bible, if much, if at all, um, just so you understand uh, some basic things. Um, the, see, the, the Bible is much more than these things that were in the question. It, it, the Bible is not even a book. It's actually 66 books. There's 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament for a total of 66. Uh, and it was written over a 1,600-year span uh, on three different continents by over 40 different authors. Um, and, and they were from men from many different walks of life. They were uh, kings, uh, generals, politicians, fishermen. Uh, and the, but, but the Bible does have a, a primary message that runs through the entire thing. Let's call it a red thread. And, and that is this, uh, the good news that uh, even though uh, man and God are estranged, God has provided a way for us to have a relationship with God. And and so that is the theme that we see from beginning to end in the Bible that is really, uh, let's say, penultimate. There's nothing in the Bible we can learn that surpasses that truth. And uh, I, this is a little excerpt from the first sermon I ever wrote and read. It, it, just, it just says, the, the, the Bible is the first book ever printed on a printing press, and it is the number one bestseller and the most read book of all time but it is also the most scrutinized, most attacked, most burned book throughout history. Someone once said, the Bible is the anvil of God and the hammers of infidels have pounded on it for centuries. Kings, emperors, and popes have burned it, but the hammers wear out and the anvil endures. So even though we can find these um, uh, teachings in the Bible, and they're all valid, and uh, a lot of good points have been made about those particular points, but really, the Bible is much more than that. Uh, ben, what do you have to say? Um, well, yeah, you guys said so much already, which, which is really great. Um, the thing I think is a lot of people, we always need to keep in, just in, 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 in uh, re remind ourselves is that the Old Testament under the law, that Israel under the law was all about how to achieve uh, physical or earthly prosperity. 
And so you see a lot of people look at those verses and say, oh, see, God blessed Abraham or, uh, you know, God blessed, uh, you know, uh, the temple was festooned with all this gold and, and ornamentation and uh, Solomon had great wealth and, and uh, gold and all this stuff. It's all about spiritual wealth. And again, the Old Testament, uh, as you mentioned, Luke, so many times, I think is really awesome. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And we're supposed to uh, seek uh, spiritual uh, prosperity uh, not earthly goods. Um, and so I think a lot of people get that confused and say, oh, well, see, I mean, uh, it was okay for Solomon to do that. Well, they're really listen they're really living under the law. They're operating under um, law principles, not grace principles and, or not spiritual principles. And um, and like Steve said, it's, it's going to burn up. The, the, it's where the moth is, uh, moth is going to eat it up. It's going to, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's going to, their money's going to rust. Um, and, it occurred to me one time is that, you know, it, it, an angel said this too. Uh, and for, you guys all said good things. I don't, don't, I'm not single out anyone in particular. Uh, but um, uh, Angel, you also said that, uh, that uh, you know, that a lot, a lot of the people are, are always, it's all about self-worth and finding yourself. Um, and it occurred to me that I, I really uh, never uh, had any, well, first of all, the Bible says uh, in Romans, Paul says there's nothing nothing good in me dwells. And so, uh, you know, the Bible, anyone who says the Bible is a, a book of self exactly. and, and positive affirmations, it's like, okay, have you read the Bible? Uh, the law is a witness that points out all your flaws and pimples and defects. Um, and it, it, not, and so uh, it's not it's anything but a positive affirmation to self-esteem, um, at least the Old Testament, you know, the law. Uh, but in grace, that's where you find... You'll never find yourself or your self-worth until you find yourself in him. Um, and that's why, again, the Old Testament is going to reveal, makes you feel completely worthless. Um, whereas the New Testament, uh, under grace, you, may, you see, like uh, Steve said, uh, Christ died for you. And you find you see what your real worth is. And you find actually find yourself. You'll find your direction. You'll find out your own worth. And it, I think you'll find a lot of things... Uh, in fact, like for example, when I when I started reading the Bible, I realized, oh my gosh, this this is what I held on my whole life. It's like it legitimized all the things that the world told me were wrong. Like for example, uh, being interested in other people, or you know, being you no, know, oh well, you're getting, you're being too nosy, or, and I get you can't be too nosy. That's one thing. But if you're interested in for the right, right reasons, if you're interested in for the right reasons, that's a different story. Um, or that it's not good that man should be alone, for example. The world will tell, tell me that, oh, no, you should uh, spread your seed and have uh, promiscuous relationships and not be committed or anything else. And, uh, you know, or, or just be single and, and, and just, you know, uh, maximize your own uh, gratification. Make cow. What's that? Make to a men going their own way. It's like a whole movement now. Oh, like, where they, they when they're mean, they're it. mean. It's, it's male feminism. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and for me in particular, for example, I, I, I have my first serious relationship was when I was like 18 and it would last for about two years. Uh, but after that I was, it was like a, almost 10 years. I didn't have another relationship and I was miserable. I never, I hated being single. I hated, uh, I, 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 I wasn't good on my own. I'm not, you know, I'm just not, I'm not complete. And so, um, again, but the world will tell you that that's good and, and, oh, well, you could focus on your career and, uh, all these kind of things. Um, so again, uh, you guys answered already really well. And, um, so I just added a couple extra points. So great answers. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Uh, all right. It's time for any follow-up, uh, points. Uh, anybody want to say more about this? I'll just wait. I quickly add, I do agree. What, it's a great point that, um, that you know we can know our worth when we realize what we were worth to God. I, the way that I answered the question was really from the perspective of somebody that is, is, is doesn't know God, or at least they they don't really know God. Even like a lot of the uh, you know people you know we would have doubts about in terms of what you know what they really believe because uh, you know they might get drawn in by like the the prosperity gospel, which I'm really not even very familiar with. I, I'm so uh, 
uh, you know, isolated. I, I was an atheist and then I got saved, but it wasn't from, you know, I wasn't going to church all the time enough to really be deceived by a lot of these um, apostasies they keep trying to thrust into the church. But um, I, I was trying to really uh, speak of the, the, I, the notion of self-love for the sake of self-love and even like love your neighbor as thyself. To me, I always took that verse to almost kind of be a, uh, a kind of a backhanded, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, check from God because he knows we're going to love ourselves, love your neighbor that much too, right? That's the challenge, really. Loving ourselves isn't the challenge. It's really the love your neighbor equally as much as you love yourself, as much as you love your own skin, as uh, put your, you know, value your neighbor's um, needs and happiness as much as you value your own you know, wants and needs. That's, that's always how I've looked at that. I mean, I, I'm not saying that God wants us to hate ourselves. Right. You know, and I, I do think that there's a, there's a type of self-love or uh, self-respect and value like it, it, that, that we can only know once we are in Christ, that we can only know once we understand this incredible ransom that was paid for us. But I think the Bible also, um, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, the nothing good in me dwells or um, the idea of, you know, we're told to, to follow our heart. And, you know, the Bible says the, the heart uh, is uh, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Right. So although the world tells us to cherish these things that the Bible, is, you know, identifies, especially in someone who, who does not have God, does not know God, an unsaved person, these things are the opposite of what we should be valuing or trusting in. Um, and I think the world just promotes this, uh, this empty pursuit of, of something we really don't have to pursue, right? You know, they tell us that we don't love ourselves enough, you know, if we, like, you know, a lot of times now they'll say that if you're, you know, if you're critical of yourself, it's because you don't love yourself and you should love yourself. And, and their definition of love is just this vacuous thing that has no, um, there's no uh, righteous judgment in it whatsoever. It's just, just, just for the sake of, 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 of doing it just for the sake you exist or, or, you know, you, there's this entitlement that they're promoting in all of our culture. We're just, like we're entitled to things. Right. And, and as a believer, um, I don't, you know, now I really like said, especially as a lost person, but even as a, as a saved person without God, without his, you know, his, his, the, the fact that we know the truth and, and, and our, our worth is only really proven or validated by, by what we know he sacrificed in order to give us eternal life. But without that understanding, uh, to me, self-love is, 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 is delusional. It's, um, it's, it's like you're trying to, uh, to skip the most important step that the Bible uh, lays out, which is to know God and know what he's done for you and know um, how he created uh, the earth for man. I mean, we, we mean so much to him that, you know, I, I, uh, I often wonder, you know, how the, how the angels really felt about it. You know what? Like, I, I can't wait to find out exactly what the deal is with the angels and, and, um, and where we differ from them. Uh, but, you know, but without that understanding, without knowing that the Bible is true and, and that God is a God of grace and, and, um, and eternal security, uh, uh, you know, that we're his children, um, to me, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think the Bible teaches that the lost are supposed to, you know, love themselves necessarily in the way that the world promotes. I don't, I don't believe that it's, it's just a lie, really. The self-worth thing without God being in the equation is a lie. It's a delusion because you're just going to burn up, at, you know, without God. Like you, you're, you're forfeiting the, uh, the, the birthright that you know you're offered uh, as a believer you're you're forfeiting the meaning that you're supposed to have when you reject god you're for like you're like and it's a waste it's just it's such a waste for those who never who are never going to believe because they they could have known uh the truth as we know it uh, which is um you know and, and people talk about like having a god-shaped hole my aunt used to say that all the time when i was lost and i had a god-shaped hole uh and only god could you know, only God could fill it only, you know, that's what I was really looking for. And oh, it would make me so mad when she said that. And I didn't even understand. Like, I couldn't, I, you know, at that time, I couldn't even, I didn't understand what people even got out of the idea of that like, they, they knew which God was real. Like, I just thought, well, you can't know. And like, what, what, what do you get out of telling yourself this fairy tale that you don't even know for sure if it's true? Like, I, I don't need that. 
<laughs> That's what I need to tell myself, right? And uh, it's in that context that self-love, the promotion of self-love is just totally dangerous. Um, it's almost like the world's trying to, uh, to provide the kind of meaning and sense of like fulfillment and value that only God can provide. And now they're trying to do it without even creating, you know, a false religion to go along with it. Now it's just, um, it's just self-love for the sake of it. Uh, uh, you know, um, and, and like I mentioned too, it's more than just love. I, you know, they're, they're talking about like the celebration of, of yourself, celebrating yourself. It's, it's, it's just so sick and twisted to me. These are, the, this is like worship that is only supposed to be given unto God. And um, uh, it's kind of interesting to watch the forms that it takes now in, the, in a secular um, materialistic society that, that doesn't even, you know, where it's not, I mean, it's becoming socially acceptable but for a while now. It's not been socially acceptable for people that are, are secular to, um, to, to believe in anything supernatural, right? So they have to find a way to serve all the purposes false religion has always served in terms of trying to... Uh, prevent really prevent man from seeking the true god i believe by by filling uh filling their head with lies or or false gods but now you know in a secular context it's just interesting to see the the uh hoops <laughs> satan has to jump through to achieve that same end um uh in the meantime before i you know he introduces his uh you know his grand finale uh you know antichrist uh man of sins on a perdition uh uh, you know, this world uh, religion that, um, you know, this, this, this uh, form of worship that we're told is coming. And I, I believe that the reason that secularism has and like secular humanism has been foisted upon us um, for the past, I don't know, what would you say, 200 years, something like that, um, at least, uh, but it's probably the last 100 years it's really taken hold. I don't believe it was ever intended to last for for very long. I think it was just introduced by, um, you know, uh, powers and principalities, uh, spiritual wickedness in high places to create um, a desperation in in mankind um, that, uh, you know, the likes of which, we, you know, we probably might not have seen um, maybe 500 years ago when the world was still full of false religion, but um, they still had enough of a, of a, of a they took the, the supernatural for granted. They took the existence of gods, you know, for granted. Um, and I think Satan has intentionally starved us out um, and, and driven us to the brink of, of madness with this uh, nihilistic, uh, materialistic worldview uh, so that we will eagerly lap up whatever he plans to present, um, you know, probably pretty soon. And, uh, and I just think that this, the, the way that they promote this, um, this false self-love uh, that they promote is really a stopgap measure to try to keep, you know, uh, just, just trying to find different ways to, to, uh, to fill that void that man inevitably has that God's intended to fill. But, you know, um, false gods have historically uh, tried to fill as well without actually calling it God. To me, that's what it is. It's just basically the, the end result of knowing God. They're trying to give it to you without actually, without you having to seek God first, you know? And so I, I wasn't, you know, I, I, I do agree that there's a, there's a sense of, there's a type of love, a self-love that is, that is biblical, but it really is, it, it, you can't, it, you can't extricate it from Christ and from the word of God. Like there's no, it's not in and of itself that, uh, that you know, self love is um, is a virtue. It's it's really it seems to me at least that to be only in the context of 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 knowing and understanding the word of God, and and your you know and, and you know man's uh, uh, value to him that there's any validity to self love, right? So uh, I was kind of talking about it in isolation from that. All right, thank you. Uh, you made a lot of very good points. I'd like to respond to some of the things you said. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that we're supposed to have this love for self. Um, I know the, the verse, uh, uh, love your neighbor as yourself was cited. Uh, I'm not sure that particular verse, um, uh, uh, means that we're supposed to love ourselves. It's just that perhaps 
look, you love yourself. Why don't you love others? Exactly. But it's not that it's encouraging us to have this self-love. Uh, I think the, the what the Bible is telling us from the beginning to end is that uh, we we should be, rather than self-centered, we should be God-centered. God is the focus, focal. everything revolves around God, not not us. And uh, all these, uh, uh, there, there's so many terms that are modern uh, that uh, part of this kind of this question, and, and that, that is that we're encouraged to have um, self-esteem. But self-esteem is just another way of saying pride when you esteem yourself. Yeah. Uh, and, and pride, of course, we know is a sin. Uh, and I believe it's, I've talked about this before, um, the love of money is the, is, uh, the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, I, I believe really that the, the, the root of the evil comes from pride. That's caused the fall from Satan, the fall from Adam and Eve, pride, uh, self, thinking of self rather. And then so uh, self-esteem is, is, not, is encouraged by the world, but that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to esteem God. Uh, we're told to have self-confidence, uh, but that's the problem with the world. People, you say, are you going to go to heaven and why? And they say, well, yeah, I'm a pretty good person. Uh, see, they're putting all their confidence in themselves, thinking they can go to before God and boast, look how good and are not good enough good for heaven. And so, but instead, our confidence has to be entirely in Christ. Uh, all confidence is is in Him. And same thing with self reliance. We're told to be self reliant, and that's what uh, God wanted from Adam and Eve. They, God wanted Adam and Eve to depend completely on Him. I made a video titled uh, "Declaration of Dependence," and and the point was that Adam and Eve made a declaration of independence. They thought they could become independent from God. They could learn the difference between good and evil and be like God and not need God. And uh, but, but God wanted them to always depend on him for everything. Uh, he, you know, from the air we breathe to the food to everything. Uh, uh, you got uh, self, uh, let me see, what's the other self? Um, uh, Self-worth. Yeah, self-worth. Uh, I'm thinking of, um, so let me see. I said self-confidence, self-reliance, self-esteem. Uh, but you, you get you get the point. Rather than be, being being uh, self-centered, uh, what really uh, is the objective that God wants is that it, uh, 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 we should, our mind should be about God, not about self um, we have a, one of the things that you'll see at the beginning, and as a matter of fact, throughout the stream, we have these truisms and these statements that we want people to think about and, and, and kind of brainwash you so that you're, you popularize these sayings. And one of them is uh, taking the word repent. And we, we always think of repent as um, change, change of mind. But we we put in there that repent, and I got this from Malcolm Smith, by the way. Uh, if you don't know Malcolm Smith, he's one of the recommended channels that I hope everybody will listen to him. He's one of my favorite teachers. But um, he, he says repentance is exchange of mind, not necessarily change. It is change of mind, but it, it is exchange, where we want to exchange our mind and instead get the mind of Christ um, uh, you know, uh, uh, in us and, and uh, in charge. Um, all right. Um, uh, who else wants to say, uh, say more about this question? Um, I just really briefly just wanted to say, and I think this ties in with what you were saying, but um, I think that as long as you're coming at the Bible with the attitude of how can this improve my life? You're going to be sadly disappointed because there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that, frankly, I wish wasn't there. Um, stories that I grew up on Bible stories, so I've, I've heard them all and I've read them all. Um, but if you're, it, you know, there's stories that are really kind of messed up, honestly. 
Um, so if you're coming at the Bible hoping that it will improve your personal quality of life, your personal self, whatever, it's not that kind of book yet. <laughs> it is after you come to know who the Bible is about and who the Bible is, namely Jesus, once you have a relationship with him, that you can go back and read these stories and you can see the shadows of Jesus throughout the Old Testament th and the his love shining through and his call all the way through from the very beginning to just to love and to, to know him. And that's when it becomes that. But when you first come at it, it's not even remotely that. It's not self-help. It's not, um, I mean, yeah, sure, there's some good, principles to live by in there but to be frank with you it was very boring to me to read the bible until i knew jesus and then it's like reading the bible is like going for a good swim it's it, there's so much depth in there there's so many layers that the lord will show you that it that you just I've never understood the concept of a bookworm eating a book. I didn't, I wasn't a reader before I got saved. And now it's like, I just want to devour this thing every day. I want to eat it. I want to swim in it. I want to dive in and go deeper than I've ever gone before. And the Lord, that's when the Lord will show you all the nuances and all the layers and how he plans to improve your quality of life not because of the words that you're reading but because of the relationship you're building and i think that's the most important part okay all right any more from anyone all right i guess ben you want to go to the next question now sure this question is true or false uh god speaks to me uh, by the way, the last couple answers were brilliant. Uh, all of the answers were brilliant. Brilliant. Um, the uh, angel, what you said about uh, secular humanism, though, and Satan's plan for it in the last two hundred years, I, something occurred that 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 exact scenario occurred to me as well, uh, where it's basically you know take this take the supernatural out of this world so that it can be uh, when it when it does come, you know, in signs and wonders, uh, it'll be uh, yes, yeah. It'll be yes. eaten up. They'll be craving for it. Right. Right? And 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 in all meaning and, and, and that's what I think we're seeing with uh, you know, even like the whole idea of truth and tr you know, even you know, that's become mainstream now, the idea of um this this secret knowledge which the, the mainstream media is hiding from us, and they are, but it's they've unveiled all of this to the world. Um for a reason i just i just see that oh, my little girl's chasing me around Shh. um but um I, yeah i agree i guess i always see like both uh both sides of it right so uh it's like misdirection and, and always trying to uh push and pull mankind uh along this agenda this uh this desperate and you know uh, guaranteed to to be the losing strategy agenda that Satan has, but uh, you know what? I don't know what he thinks he's got up his sleeve, but uh, you know, he, I, I often wonder: does he think he'll win? You know, or is this just an exercise in sadism? <laughs> you know, that, that would be a cool uh, true or false question. Sometimes. Actually, I should read. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, the I should read the comment from the last uh, single comment from the last uh, question, and it was. Absolutely not. The Bible is a witness to the history of the world from the beginning to the end, but more importantly, a testimony of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And I did, uh, I did read the, I, I, the so the next question is, uh, uh, true or false, God speaks to me. Okay. Uh, did anybody on the panel submit that one? I did, actually. Okay, I guess I guess you get to go last then. Um, I'll go ahead and since I'm already talking, um, um, I'm sure that God speaks to me through the scriptures uh, clearly by what the scriptures say. And uh, thankfully, um, now and again, uh, I feel like there's a revelation that about the scriptures that is, um, 
profound that oh i i get it now uh, where maybe i've read and even studied it many times for many years and yet suddenly there's an epiphany and then there's an understanding and um i i think that god uh, probably does re reveal these things to me uh and to us um however uh um i hear sometimes um people uh say saying that god gave me this and uh, god spoke to me or in this way uh and, and then whatever they say after that it's basically what we're doing when we do that is we're elevating our words that come next to scripture uh i i think it's a very very risky thing to do and and uh i would discourage it uh uh even though it very well may be that god has told us something uh and uh it's it's it is valid that it, it's from god but when we say that this is from god it's basically you might as well say thus saith the lord uh and uh that's where i think we, we sometimes can cross the line that's that's dangerous uh, because also not only are you adding to scripture <laughs> but um uh, now you're you're putting your words in it so that they cannot be disputed because you got it from the Lord. And so how dare anybody challenge it? Uh, I've had this happen many times over the years, not only, you know, online, but in my home Bible studies, I can remember people saying that, uh, uh, you know, but I, I've often said to them, well, okay, you say the Lord just revealed this to you and we're supposed to take it like, the word of God, I guess, but uh, what if someone else tells me that the Lord reveals something to them and it contradicts what you said? And that happens sometimes. People, I've heard people say opposite things, and but they both got it from the Lord. So for me, when people say that, uh, I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, and uh, um, I, and I think it should be very, very, people should be very, very careful uh, when doing that. All right, who want, who would like to go next? I'll go. Okay. Um, for me, I would say, yes, the Lord speaks to me in a way, um, but more like bringing verses back to my mind and... Um, giving me clarity on certain topics and honestly one of the places that god speaks to me most and teaches me lessons from his word doesn't even involve me having a bible in my hands it is typically when i'm in my garden and i'm struggling with a plant and it's not doing what i want it to do and i'm talking to god asking him, I've done everything that I'm supposed to do here. Why is this plant not doing what it's supposed to do? And he'll give me, he'll tell me like, for example, um, I was working with a tomato plant once, not realizing, I don't know if anyone knows about gardening or not, but not realizing that at some point you have to stop removing the suckers from the plant. Um, the suckers actually will grow out between the stem the main stem and the leaf and then the sucker grows out and they they will steal the nutrients from the plant and you end up with a weak plant if you leave the suckers on there for too long um so you're supposed to go in and pluck them out and i was going in and i was plucking out these suckers and i could not figure out why i wasn't getting any tomatoes and very clearly i heard the lord say that's where the fruit grows and I stopped and I was like, wait, I've been pulling the fruit off. Yes, when the plant was weak and young and, and was not mature, I had to pull those suckers off. But at some point you got to stop and you got to let the fruit grow. Oh my goodness. And so in that moment, yes, I did feel like God taught me a lesson and it was about more than just a tomato plant. It was about 
lessons in my life that you have to come to a certain level of maturity before you can bear bear fruit you can't expect to have fruit right away in your in your walk you have to grow up first I know exactly what you mean about the lessons God shows through gardening. Um, uh, sorry, my kids. But um, that, I just wanted to add that in. Yes, I know exactly what you mean, Heather, and I will say ditto to that. I've learned more. God showed me more things through um, things I do now living out in the country. You know, I don't know how I would have learned some of these lessons if I didn't have a garden and chickens and stuff like that. So. Okay. All right. Well, while, while you're talking, uh, Angel, do you want to continue and answer the question next? Can somebody uh, go first real quick so I can run away from my kids <laughs> real quick? Sure. Uh, they're going to be too noisy. Okay, Steve. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, does God speak to me? Sure. Um, I, I think I'll pretty much. Uh... Oh, there. Now can you hear me? Okay. Um, so yes, does, does God, God speak to me? Yeah, I think he, uh, the, there's a verse that says, uh, you know, that God speaks through a still small voice. He's, you know, um, it, it, that quiet, still small voice that's inside of you that he speaks to you with. And sometimes, like Luke said, uh, it's, it's through scripture. And most of the time, I would say it should be through scripture. Um, sometimes it's God reminding you of his word when you're, uh, you know, uh, going through something or talking to someone ab about something or tonight as we've been going, you know, I'm reminded of a particular verse or passage or story from the Bible. Um, I think those are all ways that God talks to you. I think uh, what Heather uh, talked about is absolutely another way that God can speak to you. Um, Romans one, Romans chapter one, verse 20 uh, shows that to be a correct way that God speaks. Um, and uh, God's been, you know, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And from the beginning of the creation of the world, he began with speaking. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> God's still speaking, but the scripture is our balance or our level against what someone says when they say God spoke to me and told me something. Uh, Luke mentioned revelation, uh, something in scripture being uh, unveiled or unpacked, kind of, kind of so to speak, uh, where God shows you something deeper in scripture. Uh, and so scripture should be our our balance or our, our level about what other people are saying or what they think has been revealed to them, whether it's about something that's that, you know, in scripture um, or uh, about, you know, something to come, whatever that might be uh, the number one balance or level of any type of thing like that is that, uh, uh, is, is the gospel um, and the gospel being saved by grace and not of works. And if someone is coming to you saying, God spoke to me and then goes and says, or God revealed something to me and says, yep, uh, there's going to be Christians burning in hell. Well, then I can surely tell you that person is not speaking from God because those are not Christians at all. Uh, no one that has believed on Christ will ever be in hell, ever, because Christ paid the, the price for them, the wage of sin for them, and the righteousness that we have been given by faith in the Son of God. So... You know, there's a lot of things like that. Uh, to give an example, uh, someone also said, you know, uh, people can speak to us pro through other people. Absolutely. Um, you know, we wouldn't be doing this show uh, or any of these types of things if we didn't believe that we are trying 
to uh, reveal the word of God to people and to reveal the truths of God to people using our words. But as, you know, Paul uh, uh, talked to or told a group of people that they were, they were wise in searching the scriptures to see what, to make sure what Paul was saying was true. And so they did that and Paul commended them for that. And that's what we should do with anyone who's, who, who says they speak for God um, or, or they say that God has revealed something to them. But to give an example of something that God revealed to me um, and that I've shared uh, before, and I think it's awesome that when Adam, uh, God put Adam to sleep and removed a rib from his side to make his bride. And so he would have had to wound him in his side to take out that rib. Well, who else was wounded in their side or pierced in his side to make his bride? That would be Christ. So, that's just an example of a revelation in God's word that was revealed. No one spoke that to me. I actually had that revelation while listening to a sermon about something completely different. So that's just an example that that, that was a shadow of Christ in the Old Testament in the very, very beginning. So, yes, does God speak to us? Yes, he's been speaking from the beginning, from let there be light till the end of Revelation. He continues to speak, and he will continue to speak. We just need to use the word of God that he has elevated above his name. as the balance for what people say they think they've heard from God. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, Sister Angel, are you ready now? Yes. So um, I do agree, yes, that uh, for sure God speaks to us. Um, I wanted to say, when it ter in terms of the, uh, the context of God, uh, like giving us a word or whatever, when people will claim that their interpretation of whatever the issue is, um, they'll say that God showed me this or God told me this. And I, and I try to avoid that, but I've also explained before that sometimes um, the, the understanding, it, it, you know, that God might give us, that doesn't necessarily mean that the conclusion we arrive at immediately, at least initially is the correct conclusion. A lot of times God has to, to lead you through a process of understanding things before you arrive at the ultimate conclusion. So God could actually even um, uh, give you an insight that uh, perhaps you, you, you know, let, let's just say um, that, uh, you know, for instance, you, you, you start to you realize that the Bible preaches eternal security. And that's, but yet somehow uh, you go into Calvinism as a result. Now, uh, I believe that things like that can happen when God really is opening um, someone's eyes to scripture and, and leading them and even, you know, speaking to them uh, in a way where, you know, God knows the end from the beginning. So he'll know, you know, uh, uh, where he's trying to lead you. Sometimes that involves leading you through error initially. I mean, a lot of, you know, <laughs> none of us have everything all right. Um, and uh, a lot of times we had to, we have to be wrong first before we can be right you know we have to we have it's a process a process of um of revelation of of, of maturity and um and study and just getting to know god um i i find uh for me um you know i i i definitely uh i i definitely try to stay away from from proclaiming you know my interpretation unless it's like i mean 100 percent indisputable from scripture like for instance um you know grace uh I mean, you know, grace through faith alone, uh, things like that. But, you know, when it comes to anything, uh, 
uh, you know, that's maybe a little bit controversial or, you know, people that I, that I really respect um, and, and consider solid believers, they don't really see it that way. You know, uh, I think that, I think it can be, you know, dangerous and, and uh, too tempting for a lot of people where they'll say, you know, they'll just throw that around like, oh, God showed me this, you know, God shows me a lot of things as he's trying to teach me, uh, teach me about uh, uh, the word and about, um, and about the world and about, you know, spiritual principles. Um, that doesn't always mean that the conclusion I'm about to say out of my mouth is his conclusion, is his truth, but he can, he can definitely show us, uh, uh, lead us down a path to, to where we actually uh, arrive at the right conclusion eventually. But um, what, what Heather said about uh, how God teaches her things through um, gardening, I, I know exactly how she feels. Uh, God has also taught me a lot through animal husbandry. And I don't just mean I learned a lot. I mean, um, I'll be pondering, like, for instance, like the way, uh, the way chickens behave, the way that they're, they're a flock and they, uh, they look to, you know, my chickens. And I think most people, you know, if they take care of their chickens, they look to you with like ultimate trust. You almost can't imagine how they could survive without people. Like they're so, you know, they're, they're kind of helpless and, and, um, uh, dumb, <laughs> you know, they're not, they can, there can be smart chickens, but, but like they, they, you know, they get themselves into trouble. They, uh, they can't see in the dark. I mean, even when the sun just starts setting, they have a hard time. Uh, you can tell that they are, they're created to be cared for. Um, that, that, you know, that, that, and I think that one thing God, I, I feel, you know, when I mean, cause God is the source of, you know, all wisdom, all understanding. So, uh, but I think, you know, we can kind of, I know I can discern that still small voice at times that will give me like just sort of a, a burst of understanding or, or um, you know, to this mo today, uh, early this morning, um, I was texting Joel, uh, just, you know, I love you, have a good day. Um, and what did I say? I said that it was still a miracle to me every day, just, um, just how loving our, our relationship is, just uh, that I don't take it for granted. Um, and then, uh, I, and I feel, because this isn't something I normally do, I don't normally like quote scripture out of in text messages when at work, but um, I, I, I realized right then, I was like, I have such a hard time expressing just how much I love him, just how I feel about him. I don't know if I'll ever, I wish I had turned my heart inside out and actually show him, um, uh, completely instead of having to rely on insufficient uh, <laughs> uh, you know English language to try to express it it just you, know, you end up saying the same thing over and over again um, and I, I felt that it was just strange it came into my mind this um, was I has not seen nor ear heard um, nor I, mind imagined the things that God has prepared for them that love him uh, and, and this wouldn't have been a, like a natural thought process of mine, right? Like for me to go to that verse, it doesn't seem related. And in that very moment, I thought, wait a minute, God, are you telling me that perhaps that's one of the type of things we could look forward to is that in eternity, maybe we'd actually be able, our loved ones would actually be able to know just how much we, you know, we love them in this life where words always failed, uh, <laughs> you know, here on earth. Uh, I just tried even the, uh, yes at the type of things God's describing in that verse but I, I I quoted that verse to him and I said no I hope so I hope I hope maybe one day in eternity you'll be able to um you'll be able to see exactly the thoughts of my heart regarding you where words always fail and uh this was at eight in the morning right and so while I can't prove that you know to other people that that was something that God um a thought God inspired in me I know how I know the difference. And I, I felt that God really just kind of gave me that almost as a, because it would have been, it was a beautiful thing to say, um, you know, to my husband and, and just uh, like a little burst of understanding about, about the kinds of things that maybe we can look forward to in the future. But to, 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 pro that there's one, it's one thing to say that, that God is there in those moments that he is revealing these things to you or, or acting um, on your behalf to, 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 uh, to help you come up with, you know, 
uh, words of affection for your spouse. Um, I believe that that's the God that, that, that I know. <laughs> I know that he loves me that much. And he's that personally involved in my life where, where he's there all the time, helping me with gardening, um, you know, helping me, uh, helping me in my marriage. Um, uh, I, I believe that, but that's a, that's a very different thing from saying that, um, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people, they'll say, oh, you guys, you've got it. This is groundbreaking. You've got to hear this. The, you know, the scripture is finally unsealed. God showed me this. Uh, and and they they profess to have some type of divine revelation that literally everybody needs to know. And it's 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 uh, universally applicable. And, you know, perhaps they're the first one that ever that ever figured it out. That's that's the type of, you know, God speaking to me that I think most of us bristle at. But when it comes to our own personal um, relationship with God and how we interpret his voice um, uh, in our day to day lives, that's very personal. And some people might might hear him audibly. Other people might, um, you know, just have the thought uh, occur in their mind in a way that it doesn't it wouldn't normally in a, in a way that's not their own natural thought process. And that's what happens to me. Um, and I don't think yes. I think as people that believe in God, we should never doubt other believers when they say that um unless they're starting to make assertions that uh you know for like i like i said about like some divine specific revelation you know like as if they're a prophet that's different but um uh, if we know god and and we believe that he really is like has counted every hair on our head and he's personally invested in our lives i think we should should have no doubt that he's speaking to um to his children uh all the time you know in, in different ways uh, you know, it's a personal thing, but, um, anyway. Yes, I agree completely with that. In fact, um, while I was sitting here listening to you speak, um, <laughs> verse came to mind in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and yes. I know them and they follow me. Yes. How can you hear God's voice if he's not speaking to you? So I do believe that God speaks to you, and I, I believe that Jesus himself speaks to us um, and, and reveals stuff to our hearts, whether, like you said, audibly or just something, uh, in something a thought that comes to your mind that wasn't quite something you would have come up with on your own. Right, right. And you know what's weird? You mentioned Jesus specifically. Typically, I feel that I'm kind of uh, interacting with God on that level. But one time, strange, one time I was driving and I was thinking about my mother who had passed away, um, who's a believer, right? And uh, I was kind of just running through my head all the people that I'd lost and, you know, where I thought they were, right? And my mother entered my mind and I was, um, you know, kind of just thinking back as someone who was an unbeliever while she's alive, so not really assessing her faith, uh, looking back on, on, on her faith, and, uh, and what she believed. And it was very strange because like I said, when I'm uh, pondering these, you know, the things of God and uh, praying, I'm praying to God, God, the father, I don't, you know, pray to Jesus directly. That's just me. Uh, I, you know, I, I, that's just what I always feel like to me. And I think that's what the Bible uh, demonstrates. I don't think there's anything wrong with praying to Jesus, but typically I feel I'm interacting with God, the father. Right. Uh, but in this moment, um, for some, it, it, I, I felt, and this was unusual because I don't normally feel like I'm hearing, uh, hearing uh, somebody say something to me audibly or even in my mind. Normally it's just a thought that occurs, but uh, I felt very strongly that I, I heard Jesus uh, confirm to me that she, that, that she was with him, that my mother was with him. And if it were my imagination, I would have imagined it was, you know, God, that's who I'm usually praying to and talking to. And this was just so striking to me. It was so comforting and, um, and special. And I, I know just from what my, my, my mom professed and, and reconsidering all of the, all of the time I spent with her and, and all the time I spent balking at, you know, why she believed these silly things that she believed the true gospel. And, you know, my family, they are believers and they believe the true gospel. So they, they know much better than me, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll never forget that moment because like I said, my imagination probably wouldn't, have, I, Jesus wouldn't have popped in there out of nowhere. I, I really felt uh, that was a, a special moment. So I think, I think you're right. I think, and I think it's, it's um, personal for everybody. It's different probably for everybody 
Um, I, I think Renee has recounted at least one unusual circumstance where she felt she audibly heard uh, the voice of God, but it, it, you know, for her, it's not common to actually hear audibly, but um, I, uh, I think we should take for granted that it happens. So why wouldn't he speak to us? All right. Thank you. Um, ben, you wrote the question. So uh, yep. give us the answer. Okay. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, when I was, a, 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 you know, about 10 years ago, it's probably more than 12, closer to 12 years ago now, I was convinced that Jesus was coming soon. I got uh, I got caught up in some kind of mania. I always believed the Bible, but didn't never, I neglected it. So I didn't really know understanding, but I was convinced that prophecy be, was being fulfilled and things like that. And, uh, and I kind of resented uh, having to walk by faith. I, I, I didn't understand why to have you walking by faith. And I, I kind of thought to myself, God, why, why don't you just speak to me? You know? Uh, and I would, uh, look for way, ways he would speak to me. I would like, you know, I'd be driving around and look at signs and think, okay, uh, this road name, and then I'm going to go on this road name and, and, and somehow I would form a sentence or some kind of meaning. So I was literally, uh, seeking a sign. <laughs> and, uh, and I realized now that was, uh, that was not, uh, that was evil, I think, uh, that, you know, Jesus said that the wicked generation seeks after a sign. We are to walk by faith. And, you know, the Jews seek after wisdom. The uh, Jews, uh, uh, sorry, the Greeks after wisdom, Jews for a sign, but we walk after faith. And, um, and I again, back then I wondered, you know, guy, why don't, why don't you speak to me? But now I'm glad he didn't because uh, I wouldn't have trusted, I, I, I shouldn't have trusted it. Um I don't trust a, 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 an external voice like that. Like if I heard audible voice, um, unless it was very something very specific to the situation, uh, it's different now because I know God, <laughs> but then I didn't. And so I'm glad he didn't talk to me because I didn't know who he was. And so I wouldn't know if it was God or someone else. I know all kinds of people talk, say they talk to God. Uh, in fact, I read a book at one point, and Renee's familiar with it. I think it's called like uh, Conversations with God or something like that. Some guy, some guy by Neil, his last name's Neil or something. Anyways, it was garbage. Um, yeah, actually, that's what, what Renee said. She said she read that book and God actually, that's when the time when God, she felt she audibly heard God say to her that this is not me. Uh, I thought that was interesting because I was, I was kind of roped into that too. I didn't really, it disturbed me though, even then. So I, I kind of knew it, knew it was bunk, but, um, you know, I, you know, I'm like everyone else back in the, back in my, uh, several years ago when I was an unbeliever, essentially, uh, you know, I basically would say, God, if you're real to me, show me. You know, and and I I, I, I cringe when I hear people say now, uh, God will you ask God, He'll show you. Uh, you know, ask God to show Himself to you. He will. And yes, that's true, and yes, it's not. I mean, um, again, uh, you know, for some people, uh, they're doing that because they're atheists. And and the Bible says a fool has said in his heart, "There's no God." And given that, uh, you know, God in in, Revel, in, in Romans, uh, Paul said that, you know. Uh, there were people who are unbelievers are without excuse because he's shown uh, through general revelation uh, th who he is, essentially. I mean, not the gospel, but who he is. Uh, you know, his, his Godhead and his, 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 his supremacy, his authority, etc. Uh, and, and his power and through through creation. So, you know, given that a fool says uh, there's, there's no God, that he re, re, uh, reveals himself in, in, in generally through creation, and that now the Holy Spirit is drawing all men unto Christ. Uh, it, you don't need to ask God. He is. He's already doing it. In fact, I, that's why. Whenever I, I I'm uh, I, I seek God for an answer, almost almost always, I, I I for me personally, I can't think of a single exception. I'm not saying there is it can't be an, ever a case for an exception, but without exception for me. Uh, so far, is that he's already given me the answer. I just need to realize it. Uh, like I, I get, it's, it's right under my nose the whole time. I, I, just, I just don't see it. I didn't understand it for what it was. That always happens to me. Um, and I think that's generally true. Is that people, uh, when they do become Christians, they realize all through their life, oh, I see all these things that I that that I I, I thought was a waste of time to look at or understand, or they're too too difficult to understand. They make perfect sense now, you know, just all these, you know, why men and women get married, why there's sexes and just creation in general. Um, and so now I, again, I, I don't find that God, I ever hear God's voice, but I do, uh, you know, 
believe he does speak to me uh, through his word. And so if, you know, if anyone says, I, you know, I want to hear God's voice audibly, I would just say, read the Bible out loud. Um, cause he's already, like, and also too, with, with regards to already given us the answer or already given, provided the answers. I believe he has given us the answers. We said we need to find them, seek them out in, in his word. Um, cause they're, they're already there. Um, and so, uh, again, I, that's why I, I feel like, and I, 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 I am guilty too. And I'm, I'm going to try to avoid it where I've said, I felt like God showed me this. And when I say it, I don't, I I never meant uh, to say that. Oh, I felt that God has uh, revealed this to me, um, and you should listen to me because it's authoritative. No, I'm just saying like I felt like I was guided. Uh, or you know, again, it was all. It's always related to never related to worldly circumstances. It's all when I say that it's always related to uh, what uh, interpretation of His Word, and so I'll I'll bring uh, passages. Uh, together and show parallels and uh, you know echoes and themes and 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 uh, just uh, or go into the Greek or whatever. Um, and I, I find in that sense, like I, I'll I'll see things that I I know I couldn't see myself. <laughs> and and so that's how I I, I I would say God speaks to me. And 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 then, but I I I can understand how that can be misinterpreted. And uh, I so I'm I'm going to avoid saying that in the future. Um, but I do got, do absolutely believe God works with me when I'm when I'm studying His Word, uh, and in fact, all the really Christ, all the things I really uh, that really bother me or I'm really concerned about, or are get really stressed out about, are not understanding His Word. Where it could be a, a puzzling passage, I just don't understand it, and I I uh, seek and am desperate, and I, I call out to Him, and and He always gives me an answer. But sometimes it takes a little bit of time. But when I do get the answer. It's like it answers like ten other questions simultaneously. So it's it's like bursts of uh, of revelation essentially. So I I really it's my it's it's my all time it's a huge high, <laughs> and uh, a lot of times I can't keep it to myself. Yeah. <laughs> I can't keep it to myself. So there's uh, you know a lot of times I'll, I'll 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 text people in the middle of the night. You know who you are, <laughs> and, <laughs> and show them and say, hey, I found this out. And you're probably going, what are you talking ecstatic about? Ecstatic but- utterances. Yeah, I get ecstatic. I just it's a huge high. It's like, ah, this is so cool. I can't get yes. used to myself. So uh, that's totally how God speaks that. to me. Um, and I know we're getting late, so I guess I'll end it there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you said it's a huge high. It reminds me of uh, Ruckman. Uh, he, he wrote that uh, he said, "Get high on the most high." And I think that's probably true for all of us. We all uh, get very high from uh, the fellowships, the study, the prayer together. It's, uh, it, it is uh, exhilarating. Well, um, we've made it to our normal stop time. So let, let's take a, a little bit of time now, each of us, and, and kind of summarize our thoughts on the, on the time tonight. Uh, but let's start with Sister Heather. Um, I think we've had a really good discussion. Um, we've covered a lot of ground. Honestly, I'm really tired and I'm kind of getting ready for bed. So um, I don't really have anything really deeply profound to say, I don't think, at this point. Um, I've enjoyed our time and thank you everybody for being here and thank you for listening and commenting and talking and that's about all I got. Hmm. I think that that was profound enough for me, sister. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. All right. Sister Angel, what are what your summary thoughts? Oh, uh, well, I just, uh, I wish Lisa had been here. I think this is uh, our second Friday in a row without her. I miss her, but um, um, most likely, uh, uh, as everything goes as planned, at least, uh, we'll be on tomorrow night. Um, I'm bad at intros and summaries. I really never, never, I always, uh, always feel awkward doing them. But um, I thought it was great how the conversation kind of naturally built off itself. I like the way that we were uh, building off of other questions and, and having like a, like two goes at every question, um, uh, you know, and responding to others. A lot of times for me, it's a much easier thing to do. Uh, maybe the initial question won't get my mind going very much, but then hearing people's responses 
uh, brings up a bunch of new things that uh, that uh, I find really fascinating. So I thought it was a great discussion, right? like really good, um, really good, uh, uh, you know, way to kick off the the return to our reg regularly scheduled uh, programming. So, um, but I will be uh, with Lisa tomorrow night, as far as I know, and um, I am just uh, really glad to have you back, brother Luke. It was uh, awesome, awesome tonight. Even though we had a smaller panel, it was great. And uh, right. bless you all. All right, thank you, sister. All right, uh, brother Steve, what's your summary thoughts? Um. <clears throat> Summary thoughts. Uh, God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Um, summary thoughts would be at the end of the day, all of scripture is to point us to Christ. And if what you hear is opposite of that. It's not God speaking. And that uh, the gospel is always my final thoughts. And that being Jesus Christ, Christos, the anointed one, the son of God, the great I am the Lamb of God that came to shed his own blood on your behalf and died and was buried and rose again to prove that the sacrifice of his blood was accepted on your behalf and that because he lives, we too will live again forever. And if you believe in him, believing that he is the son of God, that he is the I am, you will not die in your sins, for he is the resurrection and the life. And you only get to the Father through Christ, the Holy Spirit that speaks and leads the world to Christ through nature, through the scriptures, through our witness, through the preaching of the gospel. That those who believe in Jesus, though we die, we shall live because of that belief in Christ. So at the end of the day, that is always my closing thoughts and my beginning thoughts is that I'm saved. And if you believe in Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection for you, you too will have eternal life and will have it from the moment you believe. Thank you. Amen. Okay. Thank you, brother. All right, brother Ben, let's get your, uh, Summary thoughts, closing remarks. Well, I had a lot of fun. I thought it was a very worthwhile experience. I hope it was worthwhile to everyone else. Very edifying. Um, and I hope you had fun, Luke, coming back. This is it is all about fun after all. And uh I'm I'm sad that you took off your robe. You look like the you look like a Jedi master. We'll call you Luke Spirit Walker. Oh wow. Thanks. I needed a good laugh there. <laughs> um, well, ben must be applying for the dad joke position. I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> we might have Hilarious. to revoke his joke card, though. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> that was good. Spirit yeah. Walker. Luke the Spirit Walker. <laughs> Are we all when we walk in the spirit? Amen. Well, it's uh, um, 9.13 p.m. in Las Vegas. Uh, it's 12 a.m., 12.13 a.m. on the east. So we, we made it to our normal finishing time. 
Uh, and I'm happy I made it because really uh, I've been tired all along. I'm, I'm at reached the point where I'm really uh, spent completely. But uh, um, I've said it before, but uh, I was really, really sick. And I'm thankful that I don't feel sick anymore. I'm just now only kind of tired just tired and don't have the energy and still have a little bit of cough and that. So I'm so much better and getting better every day. And I'm so thankful now that uh, I've been able to be back participating on the Sunday service, the Wednesday study. And, and, and then again tonight here on this fun fellowship Friday, it was a lot of fun for me. And uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, Angel, uh, you, you made a point. I, I think Hopefully everybody, uh, we, it was a good conversation tonight. It was, uh, I got, we were able to get everybody involved and, uh, uh, and, and, you know, what's that saying? Two minds are better than one. Well, you know, everybody's uh, thoughts were uh, together was a lot of wonderful, uh, uh, some of it revelations perhaps, uh, but certainly a lot of good insights by, by all. So, um, so yeah, join uh, uh, tomorrow night. It's Lisa, uh, Lisa and friends at uh, 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern time. And then join us uh, uh, Sunday f for our uh, Sunday church service, 5 p.m. Eastern time on this same channel. <clears throat> all right. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.